raise their hand afterwards. I've also just started the recording, so this meeting is being recorded. Um, so that is the brief orientation, and then we'll come to the rules shortly, Kurt. Would you like those now? You are muted, Kurt. Yes, Brenda, why don't you go ahead and cover the rules now? Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen so that we can all look at them together. Is everyone seeing the rules? Yes? Yep. All right. So these are the rules that we have had to institute in order to keep our meetings safe and secure and focused on city business. In this virtual format, um, there are all sorts of new ways that people who are likely not members of our community can enter a meeting um, and disrupt it for their own purposes. So we have instituted these rules and we appreciate your cooperation. Um, this meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, dislay, or otherwise interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited. No one shall speak unless recognized by the person presiding, who is the chair, Kurt Brown, and no one shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak or raise hands, as we have indicated previously. Um, and if you're using a pseudonym, you will not be permitted to speak at the meeting. So as I said, as we started to let people in. Um, if you don't have your name associated with your presence on the screen, we will not be able to unmute you. If you need to have that name changed and don't know how to do so, please send me a message in the chat and I'm happy to help you out with that. Um, no, <laughs> and no video is permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers and presenters. Others will participate by voice only. Um, the person presiding, the chair of the meeting, shall enforce these rules at this time by instructing me or our other Zoom facilitator, Allison Eklund, to mute the person who is being disruptive. If the chat function is enabled, which it is, but only to me, you can only use that to, to communicate with me, the host, and only about technical online platform related questions only. Um, if you're using the chat for any other reason other than seeking assistance from the host, we reserve the right to disable your ability to chat. Um, also, so you are aware, the board members will not be using the chat either. Um, and that is so that the conversation that they're having is transparent and taking place in front of you. Um, only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. And those are the rules as we have them to keep us productive and moving forward. Um, I will say if you're joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone if you would like to participate in open or public comment. That's all I have. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Brenda. I appreciate it. Uh, are there any questions from the board about the agenda before we move on to approval of the minutes? Okay, seeing none, and obviously we'll have time to clarify things as we move into individual items. Um, let's go to approval of the minutes right now. And this is the minutes um, from our last uh, meeting, which was June 3rd. Uh, why don't we take it a page at a time just to make it a little bit more organized. Does anyone have a suggested change or correction to our board minutes uh, page one? Just raise your hand and I will call on you. Okay, seeing none. Anything on page two? And if you notice something later, we can go back. Um, moving on to page three, uh, I have one correction. And this is the section on our board motions regarding South Boulder Creek flood control project. Um, Leah, I think we made it as difficult as possible for you by putting all of the motions on the table before we uh, voted on any of them. And so uh, to reflect the order in which they were actually adopted, I think we need to reverse the first and second one. So basically we need to put Karen Holwig's motion ahead of mine. Does that track? for you. 
He can change that. Dan, does that affect anything about what's already gone to council? No, that's good. And I, I think, Kurt, you're right. I think that reflects the order of the conversation. Okay. Anything else on this page from other board members? Okay, let's go to page four, which is a continuation of all those motions. Any corrections or changes? Karen. I have a, a small correction. Uh, actually, it's an, a little addition. Um, the first bullet says C attachment. And so I think uh, right before the words initial list of questions, there needs to be the word attachment colon. Yeah, I think that's right. Good catch. You want me Originally, to that, Leah, or? Okay. So that makes sense. That was the second page that you had for yours, Karen, and just, just label it with Correct. Okay. Yep, yep. Thanks, Leah. Anything else on that page, um, members? Okay. The next page, page five, anything on that? And anything on page six, the last page? Okay, in that case, uh, if anybody wants to uh, move adoption of the minutes as amended, I would and accept we that. we approve the minutes as amended. Thank you, do we have a second? I second. We have two seconds, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to call the roll then uh, to signify approval of the minutes as amended. Hal Halstein. I approve. Karen Holweg. Yes. Dave Koontz. Yes. Caroline Miller. Yes. And I say yes, and so Leah, we have a unanimous approval of the minutes. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Dan. Thanks, Kurt. Um, this isn't on the agenda, but over the past couple of weeks, we have some sad news with the passing of um, individuals who've had a, a long and deep history uh, with the open space department, the open space system, and the city of Boulder. And so I would like to invite uh, Andy Pelster, our agriculture and water uh, supervisor, uh, who uh, would like to recognize uh, the contributions of these gentlemen. So Andy? And Andy, you might have to unmute yourself. And I'm not sure that we have Andy in the right status. I'm looking for him now. If somebody can see him on camera, you're welcome to unmute him. Sorry, I've got a long list. It's a well-attended meeting. Leah, do you see Yeah, Andy? I hear it. Let me, hang on one sec. I can, I found him. Great. There you are, Andy. You should be able to unmute now. Sorry about that. Hey, that's all right. Uh, thanks, Dan, and good evening, members of the board. Um, you may all be aware that Leah Hogan, a longtime tenant, passed away recently um, after a long battle with respiratory illness. Leo and Albert, they have leased agricultural land from Open Space Mountain Parks for more than 35 years. Um, as, did, as did their brother, Hank, who passed away in 2013. Um, the Hogan family sold property open space uh, that many in the ag community refer to as Layla's Hill. Uh, they sold that to us in 1986. Um, it's shown as the Hogan brothers' property on open space maps, uh, and it's also in the background of the larger picture of that slide. Um, Leo was a Fourth generation rancher. He lived and worked most of his life southwest of Boulder near Cherryville and South Boulder Road. Um, he certainly was a great wealth of knowledge and open space property genealogy. He was familiar with many of the farm and ranch families who sold property at open space um, and certainly was a big supporter of the program. His historic knowledge of local water rights and ditch system was also unmatched and critical in helping maintain the plant and animal diversity dependent on the annual delivery of irrigation water throughout the South Boulder Creek floodplain. All staff who personally knew or worked with Leo knew him as a kind and willing helper. 
never afraid of a hard day's work. Excuse me. Leo always made time to share his thoughts on the topic of the day or to help staff solve issues taking place on his lease properties. His presence will be missed on the Hogan Ranch and in the ag community. He played a significant role in managing up to 7,000 acres of open space land, much of which is some of the most ecological valuable land in the open space system. You may be familiar with many of the lease areas, including the South Boulder Creek floodplain, Davidson Marshall Mesas, open space southern grasslands and the grasslands west of Highway 93, oh, including Jewel Mountain. Once you're done, you're going to play with me, okay? Thanks a million, Leo, for your many years of stewardship of open space properties and your mentorship to so many people around you. Um, also, thanks to Molly Davis and Julie Johnson for providing photos on the slide. Um, we also had a long term, a long time city of Boulder and, and past colleague at Open Space pass away recently. Uh, some of you may remember Greg Toll. He is a long serving employee of the city of Boulder. He passed away in May at the age of 66. Greg was, grew up in Boulder and began his long tenure with the city, uh, working at Chautauqua when he was 18 years old. He attended CSU where he got a degree in forest and range management before starting work in the wildland fire with the, <clears throat> with the BLM as a hotshot crew member in Wyoming. He spent a few years in the early 1990s as an operations supervisor with open space and mountain parks before joining the wildland fire team with the fire department. He retired in 2018 as the chief of the Wildland Fire Division after 27 years serving the Boulder community. Among his, <clears throat> among his many accomplishments, Greg was an integral part of de developing the city's pr prescribed fire program, implementing the forest ecosystem management plan, and training wildland firefighters across the city and county. Throughout his career, he was deeply committed to the safety and needs of the Boulder community, as well as to each of the firefighters he worked with. Greg loved the West, its big skies, beautiful forests, and towering mountains. Thanks, Greg, for a long life serving the public. So with that, we lost two valuable members to the open space community and the agricultural community. Thank you, Andy. Uh, on behalf of the staff, thanks for putting those words together and, and conveying what these have meant to the system and to you personally. Um, thank you. Um, Brenda, I think we're ready to move on to public comment. Great, thank you. All right, so we will start with our list of folks who have signed up for public comments. Um, and so and we were going to, I'm sorry. Yep, yep, with Molly Davis. Great, right. thanks very much, Brenda. Absolutely. So Molly, I'm coming to you first. Molly will be followed by Julie, For Julie Thorpe. Um, unfortunately, again, in accordance with our rules, um, we're unable to use video um, unless Kurt would like to choose otherwise. Um, so I will come to Molly first. Sorry, everything on my screen moved. And Molly, you should be able to unmute now. Okay, thank you. Molly Davis. I was a former Warren member. The Hogan family was one of the original Boulder family with the homestead that predated the city charter. When I was on the ward, I always heard about Babe and Leo. Finally got to meet them. Leo was a long time lessee and owner of the Hogan Ranch. And alongside his brother, Babe, they managed the Hogan Ranch, which through many acquisitions became the 7,000 acre ranch in the south end of our system. When you come down 36, you can see it on the left. Leo spent his whole life in Boulder. It takes very hard work to live on a ranch for a lifetime. Leo was a very hard worker. He had many nieces and nephews that were extended family. If you went to a branding, and I attended a few, 
they were all together pitching in. Wherever there was hay to bale, cattle to move, or men to repair, their jobs were shared by all. Irrigating a large ranch takes the knowledge of many, many seasons. It is the sheer spirit of our lessees which enrich our system. Mia, thank you for your contribution. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Molly. And next we're coming to Julie Thorpe. So Julie, as soon as I find you, hey, as soon as I find you on my list, I will ask you to unmute. Julie, you should be able to unmute now. Thank you and good evening. My name is Julie Thorpe. I live at 756 Locust Avenue in Boulder. On June 19th, I sent an email to the Open Space Board of Trustees asking that as compliance of mask wearing and social distancing was not consistent, consideration be given to vulnerable populations. I requested that Open Space Mountain Park provide trails for vulnerable populations on specific days and times, even a few times a week, as we all need trails where citizens are and feel safe. I'd like to suggest three ideas generated by some of my fellow vulnerable hikers. First, we ask that you do provide these suggested trails for vulnerable populations on less crowded days and times. These trails can be advertised, identified, and explained for vulnerable populations. And while not denying access to others necessarily, this would provide another level of awareness that at this time on this trail, you really need to be aware, wear a mask, and be considerate. Second, we ask for a renewed effort and revised campaign with a big, clear, wear a mask message. With many tourists in town who come from places without mask requirements, with 30,000 students arriving next month, with increased awareness and need nationally for mask wearing, we need new revised messaging here that appeals to our better selves while educating. Many of the old message boards are no longer in prominent position, are cluttered and overlooked. We ask that you make clearer that face coverings are required by putting it in first position in your messaging. This flips the current message by putting face covering first and strengthens it. It better supports the Boulder County Public Health extended face covering order of June 29th. Then second, maintain the social distance of six feet or more. Third, in a group, walk single file to pass others to maintain six feet. Many simply don't seem to know to do this. Number four, be considerate, kind, and respectful. We are all in this together. Some of the people on the trail may be health compromised. And third, we ask that you work with CU to educate students about OSMP trail usage. Student ambassadors at CU already in place provide a good pathway to inform students of our community expectations. CU has stated that students will be required to comply with community rules. Please ensure this in regard, regard to our trails. Thank you for helping keep vulnerable populations safer. Thank you, Julie. Next, I'm coming to Sandra Larison. And after Sandra will be Suzanne Bott. Sandra, I am unmuting you now. You should be able to speak. Thank you. My name is Sandra Larson. I live in South Boulder. I'm here with two questions about OSMP's response to the coronavirus pandemic. First, I'm seeing heavy visitor usage of our local trails and what looks to me like hard wear and tear on these trails and their surroundings. So one question is, what damage is happening to our open space habitats due to heavy visitor usage? What are we doing to protect them? Second, I see, like Julie, mixed levels of mask use and physical distancing by other users. 
As coronavirus cases rise again in our state, close contact on the trails feels like it offers increasing, not diminishing risks. I and a surprising number of people I know are curtailing our use of open space because of these experiences. Some are seniors, but also, for instance, is a young mom I know who used to run the trails and now runs on the streets. Folks of all ages have personal work and family reasons that it's important for them to avoid exposure to this unpredictable disease. What strikes me is that this behavior of curtailing our use of open space is common, even though it first seemed to me a bit misplaced. After all, on open space, we're outside one of the safest places we can be these days, outside our homes. And that is the troublesome paradox. We're not going very many places, yet the safest place we can go outside our homes still feels unsafe and unwelcoming. So a lot of us are invisible because we have quietly stopped going. So my second question is who is shut out of open space due to concerns about health risks from other users' behaviors? What are we doing to make open space fully accessible and equitable? Pandemics are not usually part of land managers' portfolios, I know that, but healthy and resilient ecosystems are. Stewardship, sustainability, adaptive management are. Connection and inclusion are in the portfolio because they're in our new master plan. So I have a few more questions that might prompt ideas. If open space is one of the main public places that many people are going right now, how could we use trailheads and other portals to open space as a way to share good public health messaging in clear, consistent, non-legalistic ways? What collaboration and cooperation are needed, whether with other city departments or with other open space units in our region, to make policies consistent, uh, messaging consistent, and to be creative in finding strategies to protect nature and people? Do we need emergency regulations or policies to manage visitor traffic and protect our resources? Finally, how can we use the authority of the resource to increase both our care for local landscapes and our care for one another. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, or Sandra. Next, I'm coming to Suzanne Bott. And Suzanne, you should be able to unmute now. Okay, I think you've already unmuted me. Can you hear me? Yeah. you. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Suzanne Bott. I live also in South Boulder near the Shanahan Trail Systems. And um, again, I would also just like to make some comments about the number of people using the trail systems since the stay at home order started. Um, and I have several concerns about the safety of the people using the trails, as has been mentioned, um, and also about the increased pressure on the trail systems and how that might be affecting the health of the area and the wildlife there. Um, so, as Sandra mentioned, I'm one of those people who pretty much quit hiking in the Shanahan Trails behind our house, although that's why we moved here, because of that proximity, but I've quit hiking since March, um, when it just really became too crowded for my comfort, and, um, you know, there were a lot of people up there who weren't wearing masks or keeping proper distance, and uh, as a result of that, I felt uh, forced to repeatedly get off the trails, which I didn't like to do because I knew that that wasn't uh, good for the landscape, even though I was trying to be very careful about where I stepped. Um, but, um, you know, I noticed a lot of people who were just starting to hike along the sides of the trails and trampling down the vegetation. Um, and with all those extra people came more dogs off leash as well, uh, many of who run just uncontrolled through the woods. And I've always worried about the dogs up there since I've been hiking up there um, in terms of how it might affect the wildlife. Because uh, it's really pretty rare to see any animals up there. And I've always kind of suspected that's because of the large number of visitors and dogs. Um, so my request of you would be to know whether you are doing any research into how much local trail usage might have increased, what effect it's having on the ecosystem, whether people are doing a better job of behaving in ways that allows everyone, including older people like myself and others who are trying to minimize contact, um, to feel safe using the trail systems, because many people don't right now, and what ideas you might have to address these issues. So one thought that came to my mind was that the Shanahan trails may be more heavily impacted because dogs can be off leash there. And if that policy was changed, it might have some immediate effects on spreading out usage, maybe encouraging people to recreate a little closer to home, 
definitely giving a much needed break to the wildlife and the habitat up there. And if you do find that crowds are exceeding the capacity of the area to cope, another thought might be to charge an entry fee for those who are outside of the OSMP taxing area. Um, again, spreading people out a little bit more and also bringing in some much needed revenue to you guys for maintenance and repair of the trail system. So those were just a couple of my ideas. I appreciate you listening and I'd really love to hear your thoughts and your ideas on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Next, I'm coming to Lindsay Sterling Frank, followed by Elle Cushman. Excuse me. Sorry about the interruptions. Uh, Lindsay, you are being asked to unmute now. You should be able to unmute. Okay, are you ready? Yep. Okay. All right, Lindsay Sterling Crank here, 210 Brook Road in Boulder. I'm the Director for Prairie Dog Protection for the Humane Society of the United States. And I've been working um, with Keep Boulder Wild on this expedited review of prairie dogs on open space for over 12 months now. And before that, two years with the Prairie Dog Working Group. And before that, well, it's just been many years working on prairie dog protection in Boulder. Um, and I have to say that while I respect so many people that were in this process, I feel like the public process really just went through the motions and didn't include so many of the environmental communities and the wildlife advocates input. Um, I am grateful for the non-lethal management that you guys did keep in the plan. That's something that staff's been doing for years and I'm grateful that that stayed and I was concerned when I read the most recent draft that it's even more ag oriented and less wildlife friendly. Um, I, 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 I'm, I, I have extreme scientific and even personal concerns that our open space board of trustees undid years of wildlife protections for this keystone species that many of us felt so much value in when we are spending time on our public lands. I feel like the permission for staff to kill as many as 30,000 prairie dogs, and while we're even starting with only up to 6,000 per year, we have permission to kill 18,000 animals on our public lands over the next three year, over the next three years, and that this swift action reversed years of wildlife protections that so many of us invested in so strongly. And yes, some of these lands that we're considering are irrigated croplands and those are, are, are maybe not suitable to prairie dogs. And I understand how hard it is to manage prairie dogs. I really do. I understand how hard it is for the permittees and the farmers and the ranchers and I feel for them, but I cannot support this extreme action without all of us understanding more what the consequences are going to be on this entire landscape. Um, We've been using these 967 acres and kind of all of these acres as a reserve to refill these prairie dog colonies when plague epizootic comes through. And now that's going to be decreased immensely. And I just feel again, like it's irresponsible and we don't have enough information or even assuredness that what we are gonna do to these lands is going to meet our bottom lines. Um, I ask that the trustees include in their draft plan to council to reduce the amount of lethal control by creating a site-by-site -site plan with Keep Boulder Wild and the Prairie Dog Working Group. I toured all of these lands this week and they're so beautiful. Some of them don't even make sense to kill prairie dogs on. And I look forward to working, working hard for the next several weeks to see if we can get council to take a more strategic, more humane approach that includes innovation for the permittees, ag, the prairie dog ecosystem, and looks at the landscape as a whole. Okay. Thank you, Lindsay. And next on my list is Elle Cushman, but I'm not seeing someone by that name. Um, although we do have two people on the phone. So we are reaching out by text to the folks on the phone to see if we can get some names there. So in the meantime, we'll go to Taylor Jones. Sorry, you didn't have a heads up, Taylor. But I'm coming to you after Taylor will be Selene Diaris. I apologize for any names that I am mispronouncing. Um, but first we'll go to Taylor Jones. Taylor, you should be unmuted now. Okay. We can hear you. 
Great. My name is Taylor Jones. I'm the Endangered Species Advocate for Wild Earth Guardians, which is a conservation organization with an office in Denver and numerous Boulder members. I have a background in conservation biology. I've been working on prairie dog issues at the state and federal level for about 10 years. And I'd like to speak briefly regarding the expedited plan for prairie dog management on irrigated agricultural lands. I'm representing guardians as part of Keep Boulder Wild, which is the coalition of organizations and citizens that have been engaging on the expedited plan from the beginning. And as a conservation biologist, I'm looking at the expedited plan from a landscape scale perspective, and I'm concerned that the loss of this many prairie dogs will have really deleterious landscape scale impacts. And those impacts need to be minimized and offset via mitigation in some manner. But as written, the plan does not offer many options in that regard. Prairie dog conservation is an issue that is important to me and many other Front Range residents. And I would ask OSBT to recommend to council that they continue to engage all stakeholders. Keep Boulder Wild is invested in continuing this conversation. In particular, we want to engage on site-by-site -site analysis in the conflict area and offer potential solutions tailored to each. We do not support the plan as written, but would like to recommend options for adaptive management, including conservation leases, plague prevention, and redesignation of specific properties. Thank you for the opportunity to, co to comment. Thank you, Taylor. Next, I'm coming to Salem de, de Yaris. After Salem will be Karst Post Postmuller. I'm so sorry. I know I'm getting these names horribly wrong, and I, you have my deepest apologies. Um, Salem, you should be able to unmute now. Yes, hi. No worries. My name is Celine de Yaris. Um, I live in Longmont, Colorado. I have been in Colorado for 27 years and come from the south and arriving here I fell in love with the prairie dog and have been actively advocating for the protection of this beleaguered creature my entire time here in Colorado. And in looking at this expedited plan and also being deeply involved in agriculture, my, my organization is called At the Epicenter. We work globally on uh, regenerative agriculture, and we also work closely with organizations like MADAG based here, Savory Institute based here. And I know the farmers in question on some of these properties, uh, both with Black Cat and with Macaulay Farms. And my concern is that I do not feel that we are looking holistically at the entire landscape that is in question. And this approach of having labeled landscapes based on if there's water rights there, et cetera, rather than really stepping back and looking at the entire space that we are stewards of and considering what is going to actually take us into a very sustained long-term viability of the health of this land. We have disrupted it so tremendously in our occupying for so many years and I recognize that there's no way we'll ever really be able to fully recover the biodiversity that was here prior to all of us arriving. But I think it's incumbent on us. And in particular, I asked this uh, committee to really reconsider how this is being framed. I understand there's been a lot of work, but I would suggest that there is still an enormous gap in how this problem is being considered. The uh, situation on our planet, as you all know, is tremulous. Uh, we have a lot of challenges in front of us. So for us to be taking this level of life out in an already changing landscape with a lot of unpredictability, I think is not very responsible and needs to be um, slowed down, this process slowed down and a better process engineered for long-term sustainability of the entire community, uh, all the grasslands, the, all the, the, the diversity of life that's here. Thank you, Celine. Next, I'm coming to Karst Pustmuller um, and followed by 
L. Cushman, who we have identified on our list. Kars, you are able to unmute now. I apologize again for my terrible pronunciation. You did very well. Uh, can you hear me okay? You can, yep. Okay, great. Uh, Kars Pussmuller, 383 Jasper Drive in Lyons. Uh, Boulder resident for 50 years, a member of the Prairie Dog Working Group by the city, uh, PhD in animal ecology and behavior. The expedited plan states that with its implementation, Prairie Dog Conservation will successfully continue on our public open space lands. Can that statement be true and where are the data to support it? How can the ultimate goal of removing 30,000 prairie dogs largely by killing with carbon monoxide not have a negative impact on not only prairie dog conservation, but also on the many associated species that use prairie dog habitat and depend on prairie dogs for food. For the first three years alone, 18,000 prairie dogs would be killed by carbon monoxide in their burrows. Yet in the plan, there is no analysis or plans for one on the negative impacts from this action. There are no provisions to address this massive loss or the loss to their associate species and no provisions to protect from the plague the proportionally few prairie dogs that will be relocated. This is unacceptable. The plan also alludes to how holistic the city's approach has been, what with all the public input. How can that possibly be true when one, the board appeared to have made its decision before public engagement began, and two, Keep Boulder Wild has participated extensively in this process including substantial, substantial written comments with supporting documentation, yet essentially none of our recommendations for innovative and effective ways to reduce conflicts and numbers killed are in the plan. The plan must state that the relocated prairie dogs from the project area will be released to the underpopulated southern grasslands to help create a sustainable prairie dog ecosystem there, a primary goal of the council approved prairie dog working group recommendations. Also, the use of Delta dust to protect the relocated prairie dogs from the plague must be included in this plan so that those relocated prairie dogs can survive and expand to help counter all the death and loss in the project area. A plan like this one that includes killing tens of thousands of prairie dogs in one area, but does not include effective provisions to ensure that prairie dogs will survive somewhere else is just not acceptable and should not be approved. Overall, this plan is heartbreaking and disturbing, not only because of what it includes, but also because of what it should have included and didn't. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Thank you, Kars. And now I'm coming to Elle Cushman, who will be followed by Susan Summers. Elle, you should be unmuted now. Hi, my name is Elle Cushman. I was a member of the Prairie Dog Working Group, and um, I have addressed the Delta Dust issue throughout this entire process. I've been, um, it's probably been my most important issue. I, too, am an environmentalist, and I have always fought for balance in the ecosystem, and I have fought for our heritage farmers and ranchers and their presence here. As to Celine, I don't believe that you get 160 years continuance, seven generations on the same land with poor management practices and degenerative land management practices. This is the first time in the Cushman's 160 year presence here on these very same hay meadows of maybe not perpetuating life into the next generation here. And of course, I love my prairie dog girls and I support what Lindsay and Cars say. And I do believe that, it, and as I've talked with Ray Bridge and former and current city council members about, I do believe it does need to be a site by site program. And there needs to be some prairie dogs and some leap of control to attain this balance. And I do not believe that the prairie dogs need to be completely, nor should they be completely removed from the irrigated lands. The riparian areas, the water areas, 
are where the trees live and where those birds live. And they like the prairie dogs. And I think it needs, I proposed with Ray Bridge, who supported our proposal, it was Dwayne's proposal, to create prairie dog islands in the place where you can't get water to when you irrigate because it's too high and those prairie dogs aren't hurting anything anyway. And having a no strike policy where if they get off of that island, they're gone. But I also believe that the Delta dust issue is huge and we need to, the law is the ultimate balancing point right now. And as has been for a long time, and in the Prairie Dog Working Group, we were tasked with finding recommendations within the existing framework. And Delta Dust, at the federal level, EPA is not allowable on irrigated, flood irrigated fields. And the city attorney has said such to staff members. That mixes the relocation program on these fields and as I believe it should, because us dumping prairie dogs, the Cushmans taking their prairie dogs over to the Hogan's is really not the cowboy way. And that's not what we want to do. That solves nothing. And we're willing, we've stated our willingness to work with the prairie dog people and continue regenerative land management. We don't use pesticides. We don't believe them. Anything that can kill a bug is bad stuff. That is Dwayne Cushman's quote. Thanks, Al. Thank you. And next we're coming to Susan Summers. And following Susan Summers will be Jeremy Gregory. Susan, you should be, you should be unmuted now. Hi, um, my name is Susan Summers. I'm at 4636 um, 55th Street in Boulder. And I wanted to comment tonight on the expedited plan to kill prairie dogs on irrigated agricultural lands in the city. Sadly, I feel that the government machine in Boulder has already been set on a course to begin killing thousands upon thousands of native species in the name of agriculture. I don't believe for a moment that anything I say tonight can stop this process um, or make any of you wake up to the dire consequences of your decisions, but I'm gonna give it a try anyway. Um, I wanna share some points from a recent article about another concerning issue, which is our water. Um, the article in The Guardian is entitled, U.S. Rivers and Lakes Are Disappearing for a Surprising Reason, Cows. A recent analysis published in Nature found cattle to be one of the major drivers of water shortages, notably because water is used to grow crops that are fed to cows, such as hay and alfalfa. Cattle feed crops account for a staggering 23% of all water consumption. Agriculture accounts for 92% of humanity's freshwater footprint and has long been identified as a major culprit in drought. 75% of the decline of water in Lake Mead is directly attributed to cattle feed irrigation. The take home message for me and I hope for you, um, cattle feed crops are sucking American rivers dry. Um, we must look at other alternatives on these irrigated lands and not just vote to kill our dwindling wildlife. There are alternatives available. Please don't continue to ignore these amazing alternative suggestions repeatedly presented to you by Keep Hold the Wild and the Prairie Dog Working Group. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Summers. Next, we're coming to Jeremy Gregory, followed by Pamela Wanick. I did want to share one more time how to raise your hand should you decide you'd like to participate in open comment tonight. Um, if you scroll your mouse to the bottom or top of your screen, you'll find a menu. On that menu is a, an icon that says participants. If you click that box and open it, you will see a raise hand button. And if you click that button, we will understand that you would like to participate in open comment tonight. If you're on the phone, you can raise your hand by pushing star nine. So we'll come to Jeremy Gregory now. Jeremy, you should be unmuted. All right. Uh, can you hear me? I can. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving me the, the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, 
I second what Lindsay and Taylor, Kars and um, Susan, and I'm sure what Pam will have to share. Um, but yeah, this this plan is written is it's uh, it's unsustainable and it flies in the face of science. Um, I say this uh, coming from the point of view of a third generation eco-conscious farmer um, here in Boulder County. This is about more than just the prairie dog. It's, it's uh, proven that the prairie dog supports a multitude of flora and fauna species. 30,000 prairie dogs, think about that number. This sounds like a plan to pacify a vocal minority. And while ignoring the science and morality, it's just an antiquated, lazy plan. There should not be a blanket, one size fits all solution. Nature doesn't work that way. I sincerely appreciate the time and consideration that Caroline and John and Hal have given to my company's concept that is a proven solution. We're doing this right now on a plot of land in Longmont. So how can we give solutions like mine a chance if the majority of these prairie dogs are going to be exterminated? Rushing to a decision that is being proposed by OSBT is not the solution, and it's a solution that I know that will be regretted. We need to think about this. Why are we rushing into something when we're talking about 30,000 prairie dogs and by extension, the flora and fauna species that will be adversely affected by this. This is our natural heritage. I say this coming from, like I said, an eco-conscious farmer, a long line of ecologists and conservationists. I've worked with human and wildlife conflict, not only here, but in Africa, and there are solutions, but this one that's being proposed is not the way. Thank you for your time, and I just implore you to Think twice about what's being proposed now. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm coming to Pam Wanick. Pam, you should be able to unmute now. Hi. Can Hi. You, hear me? you can. Yep. Okay, I'm going to roll quickly here. Um, my name is Pam Wanick, and I'm a fourth generation Colorado native and have been working 25 years uh, in the field with prairie dogs. I have concerns that the city is not adequately addressing how to protect colonies from plague by dismissing the use of Delta dust. Delta dust protects prairie dogs from plague, Yersinia pestis, an exotic pathogen that can kill 99% of prairie dogs in a colony during an outbreak. Delta dust is a general use pesticide applied inside prairie dog burrows and is essential for long-term persistence of the prairie dog ecosystem. It is capable of halting plague progression immediately and it is an EPA approved product for prairie dogs. The city of Boulder appears to be resisting the use of Delta dust based upon studies conducted in laboratories. However, the dosing applications in labs and other institutional applications are 150 times higher than what is used in prairie dog burrows. Field studies indicate that the benefits of Delta dust far outweigh the risk. Delta dust is considered one of the best tools to combat plague by multiple state and federal agencies. The sylvatic plague vaccine and Delta dust should be used as a combined approach to address plague. So the sylvatic plague vaccine is what the city is mostly geared towards, does not remove plague from the system. It only inoculates the specific animal. Some of our larger predators, for example, consume prairie dogs and could contract plague and die. Examples would be our mountain lions and our bobcats. Delta dust can be applied when plants have gone dormant, such as late October through February, and this would lessen any potential harm to pollinator species. With regard to the ex expedited plan to remove prairie dogs, we need assurances of some emergency break where exterminations are disconnect discontinued if there is a massive plague outbreak in the northern and southern grasslands. And this must be something that can be executed very quickly. Plague can move very fast through a range and kill prairie dogs across multiple colonies within weeks. In the event of plague and extermination, this could lead to a complete collapse of the prairie dog ecosystem in Boulder. And two other things. Your carbon sequestration studies that were done were done on topsoils, and they really should have been, um, those samples, soil samples should have really been taken inside the tunnels of prairie dogs 
not topsoil. So I'm really looking forward to using carbon sequestrant, sequestration studies that are more appropriate to the prairie dog ecosystem. And finally, we need more efforts towards reintroducing native vegetation back into colonies. There are many native plant species that are resistant or resilient to prairie dog activities and would produce a different type of landscape than what you see right now. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. And Kurt, at this time, I see no other hands raised. Okay, Brenda, thank you very much. Thank and thanks to all the members of the public that uh, contributed their comments. Uh, again, we appreciate your patience and tolerance for doing this virtually. It is a, a, a bit of a burden, but we appreciate you hanging in there. <clears throat> so at this point, I will turn it back to, uh, to Dan to uh, address the property donation that's on the table. Great. Uh, and Kurt, I'll just make a note that some of the comments that were raised Today, some of the issues uh, uh, we do plan to touch later on in the agenda. Just a, a little effort. Great, thank you. Some of the speakers may want to uh, keep tuned in uh, through the COVID recovery update. Uh, in particular, we'll be addressing some of the issues raised. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, in regards to the land donation, I'm going to invite uh, Matt Ashley, uh, associate property agent with our real estate services work group, who's been working on this particular project to uh, uh, to introduce this project to the board and uh, and ask for your recommendation. All right, thank you, Dan. Can everybody hear me? You might want to turn your volume up a little, Matt. Okay. So this agenda item for board consideration to accept the donation of a property that we're calling the Jansen Trail Parcel. Um, for those of you who don't know me, as Dan just said, I'm Matt Ashley, Associate Property Agent. I've been with OSMP for about three and a half years now. Uh, so I'm going to run through a quick overview of the property and why OSMP considers this an important acquisition opportunity. So this is our cover photo. You can see the Jansen's residence over there on the left hand side of the photo and this is the Dakota Ridge Trail. So let's go next slide. So as an overview, the parcel to be donated is approximately 0 0.3 acres. It's located at 2675 Third Street. It's a portion of a larger residential lot in the Trailhead subdivision. You can see this on the map on the right. The full lot is outlined in yellow and the donation parcel is highlighted purple. You can see the Dakota Ridge Trail cutting right through the northern half of the Janssen's parcel there. And the fact that the Dakota Ridge Trail is on this parcel was really one of the big drivers for wanting to accept this donation. The portion of the property is located on a steep and vegetated hillside, making it high visibility from the neighborhoods below. So if you could go next slide, please. So a little bit of the history of the property. The larger five acre area that is now the Trailhead subdivision was previously the site of the Boulder Junior Academy from 1954 to 2004. In 2009, the Junior Academy area plan was approved by city council and planning board to help guide the redevelopment of the area. You can see in figure one on the upper right here, this is a site analysis from that 2009 plan. And it, you can see off on the right there, it highlights the major views and the steep slope off toward the upper right corner. And that is where the Janssen's parcel is today. So in 2013, the developer platted the trailhead subdivision. You can see on the bottom right there, this is a draft site plan for the subdivision. So in 2015, the Janssen's purchased their lot at 2675 Third Street and built their residence. Um, it's worth noting their lot is the largest in the trailhead subdivision at 0 0.6 acres and because of the steep hillside um, only about half of that was usable for building on and that, that, that's where their houses ended up. So last year in 2019 the Janssen's contacted OSMP and expressed their love of OSMP and that they were excited to be able to contribute contribute in this way to the lasting legacy of protected lands. So that's how the conversation got started. All right, next slide. So 
So this acquisition will meet several charter purposes. The biggest charter purpose we're meeting is passive recreational values. The Dakota Ridge Trail in this location is high traffic. It's on a steep hill and has drainage infrastructure under the trail. According to our visitor infrastructure st staff, the trail is also likely to be rerouted at this location in the future. And owning that area around the trail gives us more flexibility for those rerouting options. So the photo on the right, this is a, a zoomed in view of the neighborhood plat um, and kind of in the upper left area of this um, map down there, you can see the trail easement mapped out um, and you can actually see the width of the trail easement there. So within that existing trail easement, there really isn't any room to uh, reroute the trail. So accepting this donation is really a big boost for that ability in the future. All right, next slide. So this acquisition also fulfills the scenic purposes in the charter. The Dakota Ridge Trail meets Valley View Drive just to the east of this location. And the steep slope in this location is highly visible. Um, and this view gives you a pretty good idea of how visible that steep slope is. Uh, the vegetated hillside that you see in this picture offers screening between the residential area and the trail. Acquisition of the parcel gives the opportunity for improved trail alignment and maintenance that will benefit the quality of life for the community. All right, next slide. So this is a pretty small parcel, but it does possess natural resource qualities that still add to the larger land, landscape context of surrounding protected lands. It's identified in, by the CNHP as part of the State Network of Conservation Areas, or NCA. And it's identified by the BVCP as part of the Natural Ecosystem Overlay. So this acquisition presents the opportunity for OSMP management of vegetation and natural resources consistent with all the surrounding open space in the area. And this picture on the right, you can actually see this is looking downhill on the trail and you can see that drainage infrastructure along the side and then there's a drain pipe going under the trail. There's probably four or five of those drain pipes in this location. All right, next slide. So this acquisition also fulfills several strategies identified in the current OSMP master plan. Parcel is within the Boulder city limits acquisition area as seen on the right, in the blue and the heart there. Fulfills master plan strategy FS7, participate in other acquisition opportunities. I'd like to highlight if you can read in the figure there, within the city limits, there are a few potential acquisitions that may fulfill city charter purposes for open space. Um, and this is one of those few acquisitions within the city limits that still meets those. This also fulfills master plan strategies RRSE2, reducing the trail maintenance backlog. RRSE7, build new trails as guided by past and future plans. This would cover the reroute of the trail. RRSE8, provide welcoming and inspiring facilities and services by creating a welcoming and user-friendly trail. So next slide. So the opportunities that this prevents for OSMP are, as we've said, the ability to reroute the trail in the future, have more flexibility around the space surrounding the trail, uh, the ability to more proactively manage drainage and support infrastructure to make the trail more sustainable, and the ability to manage the natural resources and vegetation surrounding the trail consistent with OSMP best practices and those surrounding open space properties. All right, next step, next slide. So a big hurdle we're gonna have to go through will be carving out the trail parcel from the existing residential lot. And this will go through city planning. This will be done through a minor modification process to create the new parcel. And of course, this is subject to planning board and city council approval. Um, this is a little closer view of that same map from earlier. Just to give you a better idea of what this parcel looks like, you can see where the Janssen's residence is. Um, the full lot there is 0.6 acres and the trail parcel is 0.3 acres. Right, so next slide. So wrapping up, in summary, we're recommending acceptance of the 0.3 acre Janssen trail parcel, accepting the donation of the parcel. Um, and on the slide here is our recommended motion language. 
now I will give a chance for any questions. Uh, Dan, did you want to add anything before we go to questions? We're set, Kurt. Okay. Uh, board members, questions for Matt? Just raise your hand and we'll go to Dave first here. Oh. Then coming to you, Hal. I can unmute, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, thanks, Kurt. And thanks, Matt. Uh, that was helpful. The question I have is, uh, was there appraisal done of the property or do we know the valuation of the 0.3 acres that's uh, being conveyed to the city open space department? There was not an appraisal done um, yet. And there probably will not be one because this, this lot is gonna be kind of an out lot value and there won't be much development value associated with it. So we can give a pretty good estimate that it's gonna be below um, around a $5,000 amount, which is the threshold for requiring an appraisal for a federal tax deduction. So as long as it's below that $5,000 outlot value, um, we probably won't be getting an appraisal. Uh, but if the Jansons decided they wanted to get that appraisal to pursue their federal tax deduction, then that would be something uh, we would look at. Great, thanks. Hal. Um, thanks, Matt, for the concise presentation. And my question is a hard one. Uh, feel free to just let me know. If you, the natural ecosystem overlay of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, can you just educate us briefly how that relates to perhaps open space other, but just put that into context for us to understand it a little better. That, that plan's complex, as you know. Yeah, that's just a really kind of catch-all natural resources value layer. It kind of incorporates a lot of different elements. It doesn't mean there's any one specific species or anything like that located on this property. Um, it just kind of lumps together a lot of different natural resources values and puts them into general map areas. So that's a, a question probably better answered by one of our resources staff who knows a little more about that layer than I do. Um, that's about all I can tell you. Anyone else questions for Matt? Karen. Is there any natural resource person on here uh, in the meeting that could answer that? Because I, that's one of my concerns too. It seems to me some of these reasons for acquisition are stretching the case a little bit. Uh, Karen, this is Bethany Collins. I can um, chime in a little bit. So uh, the natural ecosystem overlay is separate from the, the typical land use designations that we talk about, OSO, PKU, things like yeah. that. Um, mm -hmm. It's to encourage environmental, and this is straight from the comp plan, to encourage environmental uh, preservation um, is applied over land use designations throughout the Boulder Valley. They're defined as areas that support native plants and animals or possess important ecological, biological, or geological values um, that represent the rich natural history of the value so, uh, of the valley. So um, in this area, it was likely applied um, because of the geological, uh, not, not just obviously because of the adjacent uh, 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 natural resources and open space um, land that has been designated, you know, on the on Dakota Ridge and Sinitas. Um, <clears throat> For, for decades, but also likely because of the, the geological influences over there, the slope and things like that. Is that helpful? Yeah, to follow, to follow up, tell me if I heard correctly. Essentially, it is land that wasn't identified as necessarily a, a goal for preservation. We're acknowledging that it has ecosystem value and it runs across quite a bit of private property. Correct. Yes, it's um, it doesn't necessarily that overlay doesn't preclude development uses things like that. It just identifies that there may be environmental issues that that should be looked at, whether it's during development during preservation things. Yeah. Yep. And it is over a great deal of public of private land. Thank you. Sure. Other questions, Dave, were you raising your hand? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up Bethany with that. Um, has, has anyone on the, uh, the natural resources staff looked at it as far as uh, evaluating the restoration potential associated with the property? 
Um, I'll let Matt answer that because he has worked a little bit with our, eco, uh, our ecological staff about the, the values there as well as the trail staff. Uh, yes, it, it has been looked at. There hasn't been a thorough evaluation of the restoration potential yet, but that would definitely um, be part of the process moving forward. I have a question for, for Matt. Uh, given, as you say, how steep this property is, uh, I would guess that a reroute of the trail is going to take place mostly off of that property, probably then coming back into it at the very bottom part to connect with the existing trail. Um, am I wrong about that? I do not have any specifics on exactly where the reroute will be taking place. Um, maybe if, if Jarrett is on here, he may be able to answer that a little bit better. But um, there's, there's Jarrett. Yeah, it's, uh, all I know is he said it was going to be, that was a prime location for a potential reroute. Hey, Kurt, yeah, we had our trail staff go look at it when Matt asked if this was an option. Um, we're really constrained by the, the easement that allows us to have the trail that goes straight up ball line. We, we get regular complaints every year about the ice and yeah. the mud on that trail. Yeah. Uh, it's likely this would allow us to, to look at a reroute and, and we'd have to coordinate with ecological staff. So this is not saying we would do this for sure, but it would allow us to cut up and go off um, off that alignment much earlier uh, right. and hit some of our other properties, which would allow a much better um, grade on the trail. Right. Uh, so so the, the, the idea would be to get us out of that easement and give us much more flexibility about where we could go. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes a lot of sense. One other question. Uh, I noticed a fairly new access point and gate there out of the, uh, I guess, the trailhead development. Is that ours? Do we manage that? Is that private? Is it public? So that is a public trail easement on the trailhead subdivisions property and the HOA manages those stairs and that gate. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's how it's, it is a public trail easement platted on that subdivision plat though. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Karen, you've how got did, a question. How did that gate come to be? It was part of the, uh, this is Bethany again. It was part of the platted subdivision that, that, uh, the, they dedicated a public access easement through that alley. Um, so the public is welcome to walk through the trailhead subdivision to access, but the, the HOA and the neighborhood is responsible for the maintenance up to, the, up to and including the gate. It's a nice gate. Uh, other questions? Uh, Caroline, were you raising your hand or? No, I was and I don't have any questions right now. Okay, uh, Hal. I have one final one for, for Jared. I presume um, you, you've you reviewed some of the conceptual plans with the current owner and they're enthusiastic? Matt's brought up the idea that that could happen, that we could reroute it. It would actually move it away from the current owner's property likely um, based on very, very rough, um, having our trail staff go look at very rough alignments. Yeah. I, I guess my feeling is here, this is a great piece of generosity and just making sure that they feel fully in on the communication on that. That's a great, great thought. And yeah, how, how this is Bethany again, um, the, the Jansons are on the line and will be available to um, speak with and, and will offer uh, a comment during the public hearing portion. Fantastic. Sure. Okay. I, ha I have two questions. Um, I, it seems to me that, that, a reroute that go of the trail that goes over into the current uh, OSMP property would help on the upper part of the trail before it flattens out. I, I fail to see how the, I mean the part the part from the edge of the Jansen's property down to the road is still going to be extremely steep. I mean, there's no way to get around that narrow alley that just goes straight down the clay soils and mud down to the street, is there? I'll leave that one for right. Yeah, Karen, if, if Matt brings them, I know I, we can look at a map and um, see it allows us, it's kind of like trying to turn a corner. It gives us the ability to, to cut the corner. Um, so yeah, we wouldn't, it wouldn't be a phenomenal trail, but it could be a much better trail is what we, we looked at. My other, my other question has to do with 
what has repeatedly been referred to at, by, as and described as the extremely steep hillside. And it looks to me from the uh, soils on the trail right now that it's a clay kind of area. And so I'm wondering whether there's any OSMP liability involved in accepting this property if we start getting slumps down into the J Jansen residence. That's a great question. Um, Bethany, do you have anything to add on that? Um, oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, Karen, could you elaborate on what you're asking as far as, so uh, as far as property we own and, and we don't have an, you know, we don't have our city attorney on the phone. So I hesitate to talk about, you know, to discuss governmental immunity, basically. I don't know what you're, what you're extending beyond as far as liability with slumps. My concern is that everybody has talked about, described this property, uh, assuming that we accept it as an extremely steep hillside, uh, you know, in writing and verbally. Um, and I agree, having been out there and looked at it. It also appears that it's clay. And we know that on extremely steep clay hillsides in our system along the mountain backdrop there, we get a lot of slumps. So my question is, if we get into the situation that this particular property that we are considering accepting starts slumping down into the Jansen property, then who's going to be liable for fixing the slump? Um, so uh, if you if you're asking, should we do a, a, a geotechnical analysis, we probably could during our due diligence period um, to, to look at that risk. Um, you know, we own a lot of property on that hillside. So um, as far as all along the, the mountain backdrop, right, all along the mountain backdrop, I don't know that we've referred to this necessarily as extremely steep as opposed to any other area, you know, any other of our properties in that area. Um, but we could certainly look, you know, if, if our trail staff recommends and, and, um, and our risk managers at the city recommend that we do a geotechnical analysis as part of our acquisition to look at just that, that potential or that, or, or the, the risk involved in that, we can certainly do that. Any other questions before we go to the public hearing? Or, or a release from the Janssens. Um, well, as far as, I mean, we know, we know from, from even recent past history that OSMP has been responsible for those kinds of slumps along the mountain backdrop where there's clay soil. I'd, I'd, if you can get me offline or let me know what, you're, what, you're, uh, what you mean by that we've been held responsible or anything like that, I'd like to know. Well, Dan can tell you about okay. properties where we've had to go in and do all sorts of reconstruction because the soil has slumped. Yeah. I wouldn't be aware of any specifics, Karen, to be, to be honest with you. So yeah, we would need to research where we were held liable and where we were required to do mitigation. Uh, I don't have examples off the top of my head. There were several just north of here in the last, I don't know, five, 10 years. North of this property, uh, Karen, yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I, I don't know that staff is aware of what you're of the of the instances you're discussing. So happy to talk about that further. Any other questions or thoughts before we go to the public hearing? Okay. At this point, Brenda, uh, I will ask. Uh, or is it Allison now? It's, it's Allison. It's me now. Hi. Yeah, it's uh, me. Hi. Uh, I we think have we have one. A... Yeah, one okay. person signed up ahead of time for public comment. So Liz and Eric, I will unmute you now, and then Thank you. You, anyone can raise hands if they want to speak after that. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear us now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thanks very much. Uh, when we bought the property and decided to put the house up, seeing that 
the Dakota Ridge Trail ran across the property and was contiguous to open space to us, it seemed like a no brainer. We're big fans of the open space and have been to many of the uh, outdoor activities that open space is sponsored. So we hope that the issues mentioned can be worked out and that open space and the city of Boulder can accept the donation of land. I think on the, the, the one issue of, of the slump, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a geotechnical person at all, but there are a number of trees uh, planted and we have planted additional trees on that hillside that I think are mitigating factors, but I think that needs to go to the due diligence uh, that uh, Matt Ashley uh, has mentioned. But anyway, we're very excited and hope that uh, the issues can be worked out and that uh, this land can go to the city for OSMP use. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks to both of you for your generosity to offer this to the uh, department. We really appreciate it and your longstanding interest in open space. Allison, do we have any other people signed I'm, up at this point? I'm not, no other signups, and I'm not seeing any hands raised in the participant box. Okay, then that closes the public hearing. And we will come back then to the uh, staff recommendation. Any additional discussion? Does anyone have any other comments they want to make uh, before we entertain a motion here? Just raise your hand. Hal. Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to extend uh, my thanks um, to the Jansons for becoming potentially part of the uh, many, many year community effort that sort of like built this system. Uh, that's a theme I think we'll come back to in this meeting. Um, and I'll say, Karen, I really do appreciate your discussion on the liability here. Um, having looked at it in person and just the importance of the trail um, regardless of where we end up on that discussion, I do think that this is a really important connection and uh, represents a, a pretty amazing act of generosity. And so I'll be supporting. And I guess it's probably worth noting that we have lost another access point to that same trail with uh, the development that's happening just to the south. Any other comments or thoughts? Okay, uh, does anyone want to make a motion? And since I can't see anybody now, I will move <laughs> that the Open Space Board of Trustees recommend that the Boulder City Council approve the acceptance of a donation of approximately 0 0.30 acres of land and all appurtenances located at 2675 Third Street in Boulder, Colorado from John Eric Jansen and Elizabeth Barrow Jansen for open space and mountain park purposes. Do I have a second? I second. That's Caroline Miller seconding. And I will call the vote then. Uh, we'll go through a roll call. Hal Halstein. Um, I support accepting the motion. Karen Holweg. Yes. Dave Kuntz. Yes. Caroline Miller. Yes. And I also vote yes. That's Kurt Brown. And so, Leah, that passes unanimously. And again, thanks to the Jansons for making this offer to the department. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Okay, Dan, I think it's back to you for matters from the department. Great, thanks Matt, thanks Bethany and, and Jared for helping work through some of the questions in the presentation, appreciate that. Uh, under matters from the department, we have three scheduled items um, on the agenda. Um, and I also have just a, uh, Steve and I have a couple of informal uh, oral um, updates, if you will, as well after our uh, COVID recovery update. But we're gonna start tonight by uh, providing you with an update in our first touch, our first look at the draft 2021 operating budget. So with that, I'll invite uh, Lauren Kilcoyne, our central services area manager to lead us presentation. Thanks, Dan. Um, it looks like if somebody could look at the waiting room just as a host that's popping up over my view of the slides. 
Um, but we'll start off with the title here. Uh, so hi, Lauren Kilcoyne, Central Services Manager, here to talk about the draft 2021 operating budget. Next slide. And this is an overview of our budget calendar. We are more than halfway through, which is fantastic. It is a very long process, and we have five different presentations to the board. So uh, we're well on our way. And, and last month had a, a unanimous recommendation of the CIP, which was a, a great milestone for, for us as we go through and very uh, excited about your support of that. So tonight is our first touch on the operating budget, and we'll be back again next month for a public hearing discussion and recommendation of the operating budget. Um, from there, after your August recommendation, we will move on to planning board and then later to city council. Next slide. A little outline of tonight's presentation. We'll start with an update on the citywide budget process and then spend some time talking about our operating budget structure. We do this every year anyway, but Dave sent over some great questions around how to track some of the narrative and numbers in the packet over to, to the fund financial. So I just want to spend a little bit more time um, around the numbers and how we arrived at some of those to, to hopefully address that. And if there's anything I don't get to, we'll make sure to incorporate that into the August packet. Uh, we'll talk about our budget approach, especially in light of COVID budget reductions. We have one budget request to walk through tonight and then we'll provide time for any questions. Next slide. So since we saw you last month, a couple of uh, pretty major things have happened. The first is that CU Economist gave a presentation on June 9th to city council around revenue shortfalls and anticipated revenue projections for the next several years. So those numbers, which we received on June 15th from the finance department, have all been incorporated into the fund financial that was attached to your packet. Uh, but the major change that we saw coming out of that presentation was moving away from an assumption of recovery in 2021 to a multi-year slow recovery of revenues across the funds in the city. So actually in 2020, um, the numbers were revised up and the net sales and use tax uh, projections for this year are better than they were last time we spoke. But we're really looking at three to four years of really slow recovery, slow growth before we're fully rebounded to, to where we were before this all happened. So for us, that has meant that we needed to reduce our out year CIP uh, with the pass of the 0.15% sales tax in November 2019. We had started to increase our out year CIP to use those dollars and to program those dollars on master plan implementation. So what you see in the attached fund financial to, uh, in your packet tonight is an increase over 2020, but it is not as much of an increase as you would have seen otherwise. The other major uh, milestone for us over the last month is that we did our annual budget presentation to the executive budget team. And that is made up of the city manager, the deputy city managers, the chief financial officer, the director of IT, and a number of other directors across the city. And they're really looking at our consistency with the rest of the city, uh, making sure that we're being fiscally responsible and transparent during really challenging times, um, and that they're on board and aligned with what we've presented in our operating and capital budgets. So overall, that went very, very well. We had a lot of support for our approach to the budget, our approach to budget reductions. And we spent a lot of time, as we have with, with the board, uh, talking about master plan implementation as the foundation of our budget, talking about investments in asset management, understanding total cost of managing the system across our functions and services. Um, and that seems to be very on board with where other departments are heading. So really a lot of kudos to staff across the organization for all of the work over the last few years to set us up to be in a position where we can manage this in a really responsible way and still be getting great work done out in the system. So. Um, as you're deliberating over the operating budget, the executive budget team will be doing the same. So we will, we will expect some high level decisions from Jane here in the next couple weeks and we'll incorporate any feedback that we get from that group into the August packet. Next slide. So this is our, uh, just to kick us off, you get a sense of how we, how we talk about our budget around operating and CIP. So the yellow and light blue pieces of the pie are what we have already discussed. And it might seem a little strange that we spend three months on those slices and two months on the rest, uh, but I'm gonna talk about why as we go through the presentation. Uh, really, the CIP, uh, both in the Open Space Fund and the Lottery Fund, are the, the most flexible uh, parts of our budget. They're the places where we have the greatest opportunity to make changes in any given year, um, to really shift investment in a more agile way as compared with some of the things that we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, to track this to your fund financial, one of the things that I want to point out is that the fund financial you receive is specific to the open space fund. 
So we do receive currently some general fund dollars as well as our annual lottery fund dollars and those do not show up on your open space CIP. It's very fun for us and I'm sure for you as well to, to try to figure, figure that out when you're doing your tracking. Uh, but there is a citywide lottery fund financial. Those dollars are allocated across three different departments and then the general fund has its own fund financial which captures all of those investments across the city. So what we're focusing on tonight is those service area operating budgets as well as a brief reference to cost allocation and our debt payment expenditures. Next slide. This breaks the same information down in a slightly different way. And what we try to do as we structure our budget it was, is we try to link things really closely with our organizational chart, with the way we talk about our programs. We want our chart of accounts and our financial system to be able to roll up into something that makes sense and something that's visible to the public and, and easy to understand. So um, you can see that this that chunk of the, the last slide that was called service area operating has been broken into five different areas. And that would be our office of the director and then our four service areas, central services, community connections and partnerships, resources and stewardship, and trails and facilities. Within each of those, there are a number of work groups, programs, many, many projects, uh, but they all roll up into that service area look. And that is how we structure our fund financial as well as our department detail page. And that's a, a form that you'll be getting as an attachment to your packet next month, which shows you investment by program. So you can more clearly see how many staff are allocated to each program and how that all sort of lines up with, with this op operating graph. Um, but what you want to see here, what we're looking for here, is that the majority of our budget is going towards our maintenance activities, our projects and programs on the ground. And you would see those in the bottom three sections with CCP, RNS, and trails and facilities. So as you would expect, central services and office of the director, we keep those budgets smaller. We really try to manage our administrative costs, our overhead costs, um, and focus as much of as much of the, the funds as we can into those on the ground, uh, into undergr on the ground service delivery. Next slide. And earlier I mentioned that the operating budget is much larger but less flexible than the CIP. And the major con uh, contributor there is our personnel expenditures. And those are the majority of the budget. So I wanna talk briefly about what we call standard FTE and then talk about seasonal and temporary budgets. So our standard full-time equivalent FTE positions are modeled by the city using city payroll projections, city cost models. And those are things that we do not control in terms of how they're budgeted and how they're included into our budget. So every year the finance department and HR are working together to look at citywide pay bans, what's the market compensation for any given position, um, and they're giving us projections of what they think it will cost to run our program with our current number of FTE. They're also factoring in our union contracts and any commitments we've made in those negotiations, as well as our benefits contracts with our health insurance providers. So every year we hear from them how much they think salaries will grow based off of our performance management system and what they're able to negotiate around benefit costs to the city. So for 2021, what we're looking at right now is a 3% increase in staff salaries and a 10% increase in the cost of benefits. So at this point, we've only done two of four personnel projections and the city continues to negotiate with providers um, and work through those costs. And so those are subject to change as we move through the next couple rounds of modeling and we'll let you know of anything substantial that comes from those negotiations. Next slide. So the non-standard positions are managed very differently. And by non-standard, I mean seasonal and temporary staff. There is a category for interns that we use occasionally, but certainly the bulk of our, our non-standard staff are in a temporary job class. So because these are annual positions and because they're hired and terminated each year, those are not managed citywide. Those are managed by the department. And that gives us a different level of discretion every year as we go through our work planning process to allocate positions based on our department priorities, what projects we have, um, and make sure that we're using that as a lever to accomplish what we need to on the system. So uh, within our existing budget, we're looking every year at how many positions are allocated across service areas and work groups and whether or not we wanna shift anything from the previous year. Um, the, the base information that we do get from the city is the city's living wage. And last year with the, with the approval of the 2020 budget, city council increased that living wage to 1742. So that is our minimum and we work up from there and then we back into how many crews we need and how many crew weeks and 
what it is we're trying to accomplish on the system. Next slide. So this is a little bit of an aside, but I just want to call it out that our only increase this year to uh, the PE that you would have seen for 2020, this happened off cycle, uh, would be the addition of the two three-year fixed term positions for prairie dog management and soil health. So these were created in 2019 and filled in 2020, and they're funded currently through 2022. The agreement that we made with the general fund at the time that these positions were created was that the general fund would pay for them until and if uh, the open space sales tax extension would pass. And if and when that were to happen, we would assume the cost of those two positions. So about mid-year, we assumed those positions and they're incorporated now into 2021 personnel modeling. Next slide. So this is, a, this is very draft, uh, but I wanted to put some numbers to, to this just to make it, to drive home the point. You can see here the way that we categorize by expenditure type. So we have our standard personnel expenditures, non-standard, what we refer to as restricted funds, non-personnel expenditures, and a total operating budget. Um, so what you're looking at here down at the bottom in totals is thir over 13 million of our $19.5 million operating budget is focused on standard staff salaries. Added to that is another 2.4 million in temporary staff salaries for a total, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty overwhelming majority of our budget that's focused on staff salaries and benefits. And then even within the NPE world, those, the third and fourth columns there in restricted funds and NPE, you're looking at 2.7 million that is NPE, but that is earmarked for specific things that are very difficult for us to change. So some examples of that would be um, the $75,000 in CCNP, which is our, our payment of, to, to fire districts for their annual support of OSMP. Um, the ditch payments that we pay every year against the shares that we own in, in ditches for maintenance, um, that's all factored into restricted funds. And so at the end of the day, what I mean by less flexible is that our biggest lever, our biggest opportunity to make shifts is under that NPE column, and that's about 1.3 million of the overall 19.5, uh, 19.6 million dollar operating budget. Next slide. And to focus in a little bit more on NPE, so I talked about under PE, how salaries are growing at 3% and benefits at 10%. There is no growth assumption built into NPE. So we're really, really focused on reallocating. And anytime we are not able to reallocate to meet an NPE need, that would trigger a budget request that would come to OSBT, that would go to city council. Um, and our focus has been on how to best manage the dollars that are in our base budget to accomplish what we need to on the system. So uh, we do that through our work plan where we're looking real time every quarter at what projects are on track, what's overfunded, what's underfunded. We're making real time budget transfers um, to make sure that we can accomplish what we need to. That has led, that strategy has led uh, to our ability to spend 100% of our operating budget for the first time in 2019. So that is a, that's a very difficult um, ship to land. Uh, we are very proud of that. And really looking back at 2015, 2016, when many of us got here, we were looking at 80 to 85% spent on our operating budget every year. That was before a lot of our sales tax changes had happened. It was before we finished with the flood. It was before the master plan. And so this philosophy, this strategy has allowed us to get to a place where we're fully utilizing our dollars. We're building credibility. We're saying we know what we need in order to get the job done. Um, and when we're bringing forward budget requests, it's because we know that that's what we need in order to accomplish our business. Next slide. And then I'll briefly touch on the two other categories in our budget. The first is debt service, which is a combination of two lines on the fund financial. There's one for our bond repayment and one for our BUMPA, Boulder Municipal Property Authority repayment. So between those two lines on the fund financial, we're paying for, uh, we're repaying our 2014 general obligation bond and then two bump of notes on Ertl and Lippincott. That represents a decrease of about 68,000 from the current year. And that is because we make final payment in about one month on the Lucetta Properties bump of notes. So very exciting to, to make final payment and transfer all of that. And then finally, cost allocation. We talked about this last month, so I won't linger on it. We did uh, hear from finance that they'll be delaying the update on the cost allocation plan until 2021. Their staff are super focused on financial modeling and financial projections around COVID. So um, due to COVID-19, there will be no increases in 2021 to our current cost allocation. Next slide. 
Okay, so shifting from structure into approach. This is not major news. We talked about this last month, but all uh, departments across the city were required to submit 10% reductions to next year's budget as well as the current year budget. And we were in the middle of the CIP process when that was happening. So we had a great opportunity to reduce about 1.8 million of the, of the reductions came from our CIP. So um, after that was done, we were looking at best strategy in terms of re uh, reducing the remaining 1.3 million to hit our 10% target. And we had some conversation at director's team about approach and felt like following the same approach as 2020 would be the best bet for us um, and worked really well for us uh, in the current year. So we proportionally applied that 980,000 decrease based on the service area's share of the overall NPE and um, non-standard uh, non PE budgets. And I have a slide that'll dive into that more in a minute. So our goal again was to have a balance across our service areas, across our expenditure types, so we weren't making major cuts in one area that would be unsustainable longer term. We know that our targets are subject to change uh, based on our work plan decisions later in the year, as well as based on uh, what we learn about COVID-19 revenue shortfalls. So again, all this is flexible. We'll bring you updates in August, uh, but this gives you a sense of our, of our approach. Next slide. So this breaks, it, breaks that down a little bit better for you, hopefully. Um, and this, we can provide this slide after the fact if that's useful. So what you have in your fund financial already captures all the reductions that were made so to give you a sense of how those were proportionally applied, we've listed here the service areas, what their original non-standard PE, adjusted non-standard PE, original NP and adjusted NP look like. These are very draft. We have yet to make many of our work plan decisions for next year uh, based on what we've scaled back on in 2020 and how that might impact 2021 work plans. So you can see based on, again, based on overall share of the operating budget is how we applied it. And then as we go through work plan decision, we may continue to, to adjust some things there. Next slide. So as we move forward, we'll continue to focus on work plan. We actually uh, next week have our Q2 work plan review. So we get a sense of halfway through the year, how are we doing our projects on track, underfunded, overfunded, do we need to reallocate? And the goal here is to maximize, even during COVID shortfalls, maximize our service delivery and, and making sure we're being flexible and meeting all of our emergent needs. We also know we want to max, uh, minimize impacts to service delivery, which for us has meant minimizing impacts to our staffing levels. It's largely through crews and, and seasonal and temporary staff and folks out there doing the work that we get things done. And so as we've gone through our reductions, we've tried really hard to minimize impacts to our current staffing level. And that leads us to our next slide, which is our one budget request for the year. And that is a personnel request. Um, it's a request to convert one of our temporary positions into a standard position. And that is our trails research coordinator role. So I wanna talk briefly about the evolution of that role. It's had many forms over the last several years and we feel like we're in a position now where we know what we need longer term and are comfortable bringing this forward. So this position started as a temporary role that we hired um, to, to complete the trails condition assessment. That evolved, um, or once that was done, we moved into an undesignated trails assessment. And it was the same employee who, who did both of those assessments. And we worked with HR and finance throughout that process because each of those assignments was in the realm of 18 months. So normally the way things work with the city, as I mentioned earlier, is if it's a temporary role, it's less than a year. And if it's more than a year, it's something that's more like a standard role. Because these were one time and because there were so many question marks about uh, Beehive Asset Management and the master plan and what this would mean long term, we, um, we followed the recommendation of HR and finance to keep that as a temporary job classification. So now fast forward several years, we feel like we have guidance from the master plan. We know what this position can accomplish. We know how much we need it ongoing and we're ready to, to clean up that position classification. Next slide. So as this position has completed those assessments, they've come and present to you actually last November, all the results of those assessments. Um, but we've also been working on how to incorporate all the data from those assessments into our asset management system. So we've now had investments in baseline condition assessments across facilities, trails, undesignated trails. And we know that this is gonna be part of how we operate for many years to come. And we are planning on how we can have future assessments across our functions and services. We've also onboarded a system called Beehive and we've been working across the city with other departments who are using the same system. 
and we're able to take all that data, capture it as baseline, but then also use it to inform our work plan decisions and funding levels. So based on what we're seeing, um, what's the right balance across maintenance budgets, how many crews should be hired in which area of our, of our organization, et cetera. So it helps to make sure that we're making data-driven decisions and it helps to keep our information current and not just have baseline data that we can then not keep updated and that becomes um, not as useful to us as we move forward. Next slide. And finally, we understand the, the connection of this position to the master plan. So I've mentioned this earlier, but understanding total cost of system management, we feel like this position is, is really critical to allowing that to happen. So we would use the data that was cl collected from the baseline to support life cycle costing and inform budget allocations. We would also make sure that we're keeping things current and helping to reduce the trail maintenance backlog by having this position field monitor about 20% of the system each year, make those real-time updates to Beehive to support our work plan, and then use the information to integrate into maintenance budgets. And finally, this position we feel is critical to our ability to reduce undesignated trails. Again, field monitoring about 20% of the system a year, so every five years we would have a full review of the system. But this is also the position that calculates the miles of undesignated trails that we're seeing across the system to support our work planning on the restoration and ecological side of our work. So this position would be analyzing trends around social trail use, including emerging social trails, and allow us to report on, out on where we have effective restoration efforts. So um, we really feel like, you know, whether we're talking to ecological staff or trail staff, what we're hearing all the time is we need to keep this alive and we need to keep it going and make sure that we're getting real-time updates to, to capitalize on all the great work that's been done that's, that's allowing folks to do their job more efficiently. So uh, with that, I think my final slide is whether there are any questions. Thank you. Questions for Lauren, and thank you. Another great presentation. Um, I cannot see, let me make sure I can, there we go. Okay. <laughs> I can see people if they raise their hands now. So if anyone wants to raise hand, Karen. I have a, a question about the uh, standard, vacant standard positions that um, are mentioned at the top of page two for this agenda item. And also they're mentioned uh, in a little bit more detail on page nine. And what I'm wondering is whether you can tell me a little bit of the thinking behind um, vacating these positions. Yeah, thank you. And they are already vacant. So yeah. the way that we've managed our staffing to sort of to manage our headcount, make sure that we've got enough dollars to support positions ongoing is that we focused on attrition and when there are naturally vacancies in the organization and use those as an opportunity to make decisions. So last year in July, when we were talking about operating budget, we were saying how there had been two positions post flood trail positions that had become vacant. We had repurposed those to agriculture. So uh, we're assessing, do we need to repurpose those to a greater department need? Should we fill them as is because there's a clear need? Um, is there an opportunity to expire them to save money? So we're, we're looking really at all of the options. So the positions that are listed are, are currently vacant uh, for a number of reasons. Folks got a new job or moved or whatever it might be. And so on the slide that I showed around pre and post reduction, non-standard seasonal and temp changes, what we are hoping to do is say to service areas in the third quarter, here is your target of how we'd like you to reduce your personnel expenditure. We expect that because of the annual hiring and terminations that come with seasonals and temps, that those are the easiest places to make those reductions. However, if it is a better business decision for you to keep those standard positions vacant, you can use those standard salary dollars to hit that target if you'd prefer that to cutting a seasonal or temporary position. So right now at this point, we just want to make sure we're leaving some flexibility, not knowing how much we're going to need to cut. Um, we heard a couple weeks ago that the general fund is being asked to cut an additional 7% on top of the 10% that was already reduced. So I'm, I and we are trying to be as conservative as possible and give us as many options as we can moving forward. But my expectation right now is we would say to trails, here's your target, and they would choose to make it up with either seasonal savings or standard savings. And we, uh, Lauren, if I may chime in and correct yeah. With the uh, vacant uh, positions, uh, there wouldn't be a proposal 
uh, to eliminate those positions, Karen, that would just be sort of an, uh, an extension of a freeze of rehiring them. So if we just went three or four months without rehiring that position and then rehired in May, that might be a way to hit those savings as well. And so it's, it's not that we're proposing to eliminate them forever from the staff force. It's just a temporary decision to- Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Thanks to both of you. And, and one other follow-up thought that I think you implied is that it sounds like it's the working group themselves that made these decisions about their yeah. workload and, and what they could accommodate or, and live without and so forth. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for clarifying. So we've got a kind of a process where targets are given to service areas. Those service areas would meet collaboratively to make a recommendation. And then those recommendations would come to the work plan steering team to affirm or tweak or whatever it might be. Uh, but yeah, through, through all the 2020 reductions, I think 99% came from the, from the work group saying, here's our priorities and here's how we think we should make those cuts. And we would expect to do the same thing for 2021. Thanks, that makes sense. At the top of page three, there's one sentence that I've read three or four times and I just can't understand what it says. Can you explain to me the sentence at the top of page three? Around reserves? After submitting 10% department budget reductions for 2021, the overall operating budget is an approximately $200,000 increase from 2020. Yes, thank you. And I think if I had to guess, I think this is part of Dave's intent too with this question. So I would say in, in any given year, making 100 plus changes to our base budget, just shifting dollars across the org. So for every position, we're modeling a 3% increase, but then in other parts of the org, we're making reductions. And so even at a 10% reduction from 2020 to 2021, that overall budget is still increasing. So we're modeling that we're absorbing two new positions from the general fund, <coughs> will go up 3%, benefits will go up 10%. And so the increases are still outweighing the decreases that we've made through our 10% reductions. And this is on 2021 is the first year that the 0.15 sales tax extension gets fed into it. Ah, okay. So we yes. have increased yeah, revenue exactly. coming in. So there's new money coming in. Yep. Okay, thank yes. you. That helps. And Lauren, you pointed out that that new money is part of what helps us to not take a big cut. Um, I know these things are never neat and clean, but I'm sure council would love to hear the things we're not having to give up because of the tax increase or the things we're able to add, uh, you know, to make it a little more concrete, if you can. I yeah, think that's be great. great. Yeah, I appreciate that feedback. Cara Skinner, who's director over in finance, has been asking us every time we submit reduction, well, we are not reducing. <laughs> so we're starting to get into that um, mentality as well. But yeah, point taken, that's great. Thank you. Okay, you bet. Other questions? Yeah, Dave. Lauren, thanks for that. Uh, despite what I'm gonna say, you, the, uh, the presentation was very comprehensive as well as the memo and I appreciate that. As you know, I guess my concern is a more general one and that is that I found the narrative to be very specific, but I think I, you know, referenced to you and Dan that it would be very helpful from my perspective to have numbers associated with some of the narrative statements uh, in the memo so that as one works through it, you can see the correspondence or the comparative um, association of the numbers. And I'm, I'm specifically thinking about you know, budget totals. And so what I found confusing was that we, we came up with a budget, you know, early on, and then it, there are some adjustments to it and, and you know, and, and ongoing things like that. So being a visual person, for me, it would be very helpful to have a graphic or however many graphics one might need to present that so you can comparatively see, okay, here's what we initially came up with here's what you know our our reductions to date are showing us and so here's what actually we're bringing forward as, as the final budget and 
uh, so as I said in my comments, uh, as I worked through this, I had a, a difficult time looking at the fund financial and trying to figure out kind of from the narrative where exactly, you know, the, uh, the numbers represented uh, in the narrative. So that would be my one suggestion and uh, kind of a, a secondary one would be in the executive summary up front, we want to know, or it strikes me that the board wants to know what the budget for 2021, what the proposed budget is and, um, you know, what adjustments um, there are. And so from my perspective, it would be it's very helpful fair. for the summary to say, here's the, you know, the proposed 2021 budget and here's how, um, we'll, you know, we arrived at that through, you know, whatever the reductions or uh, considerations were. So anyway, I uh, would appreciate, uh, you know, another graphic or graphics, which would kind of, again, comparatively um, show the correspondence between the narrative and, you know, what, what the numbers are. And on the pie charts as well, you know, this is a trivial thing, but I think, again, it would be helpful to have the total um, you know, somewhere under the pie chart or whatever, so that one can look at the pie chart, go to the fund financial and say, okay, yeah, I get kind of where all this is coming from. So anyway, uh, those are my suggestions. Great, thank you. Uh, Hal. Yeah, um, Lauren, thank you so much. Uh, of course, your work always very detailed and thorough. Um, sitting through and learning from you in the first year, I finally feel in a place where I can have a comment or two that it, at least to me feels, feels meaningful. Number one, on the uh, primary projections out to 2026, the way that we're including lease and miscellaneous revenue in one volatile line, I think does a little bit of disservice to the indicator it's actually supposed to be, which is how well is that part of our land stewardship going? Um, if it's possible to, in the future to basically break that out and or give a description of the volatility there, that would be helpful because um, it kind of gives the impression that the lease business is volatile, more volatile than it is. Um, one thought. The, the, the other thing that I'm sort of noticing, um, and granted, uh, like you, I'm a finance person, so I, I see the narrative in the numbers more so in the words often. And um, we've done so much great work on the master plan. I do have to note though, when I add resources and stewardship and trails and facilities together, and I look at our 2019 actual, and then I look at where we're gonna be in 2026, I'm not really seeing much growth. I'm seeing material growth in community connections and partnerships. And yet the story we've been telling people is about the shift to maintenance. So I, I add that that I, I don't feel we're really communicating it through this. And I know a lot of this is internally uh, pointed and, and works for those purposes, but I, for the person who reads the numbers, that, that narrative doesn't come through as well. And then last but not least, um, you know, it's always hard being board members. We obviously uh, care about our staff super deeply. Of course, we speak also for the taxpayers. And, you know, related to the budget request, um, I, I just know that many in the community obviously um, were delighted with the quality of the work and, we, and, and I as a board member am always sensitive about requesting more data because I know data is expensive. Um, and so I just think the community sometimes is looking and seeing, well, what we're interested in is actually picks and shovels on the trails as opposed to more office related stuff. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I think you did fantastic work, but those are the comments I'd like to make. Yeah, thank you. And um, we can certainly break out those revenues. Um, past, we've given a list of sort of what makes up those, those buckets as well, um, which would be easy enough to provide. Um, and then point taken around the, the service areas, about half of that CCP line is the Ranger work group. And so I think that's the, that's the distinction there. Um, We've debated too over the years around CIP and should we lump it at CIP or try to assign it to a service area to show being there. So that's that's good food for thought for me to, to figure out a better way to do that. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have one other comment to one, uh, one, one small question on the end. 
will you just quickly take the volatility out of the lease line item and tell us how you see the lease business fundamentally over the next five years? Yes, right now we're in the next uh, in this presentation. Yeah, it's, it's relatively stable, and um, we're looking. At, I would I would want to talk with Andy a little bit more about what we're what we're seeing in terms of new tenants and what that means and how the ag plan factors in around rates. Um, at least in the last five years that I've been here, it's relatively stable, and the volatility has been more um, bequests, donations. Um, some small oil and gas revenues, things like that. So we can we can certainly break that out to make that more clear. Before we leave that, and I know Dan, you have another comment, but on the <laughs> on the lease and, and uh, miscellaneous revenue line, and also down on the uh, capital improvement program line, there are huge drops in 2021. Is that a, a indication of some financial thing that's being accounted for, or is that a real drop? Yeah, thanks. So on the lease and miscellaneous revenue side, you'll notice we go from just over a million in 2019, we spiked to almost 3 million and then back down to what yeah. we were a typical level. So in 2020, in the current year, that re represents one-time income from the sale of the Coleman and Suits houses. Um, oh. those properties. Yeah. So when we parceled that off and, and sold the houses, we have the revenue there corresponding to the increase in acquisition funding. So uh, we've been decreasing acquisition funding, but we wanted to capture um, that those dollars are then returned to the acquisition CIP to, su to support some future work. Uh, and that was all outlined at the time that we bought it. But yeah, I mean, more, more to the point of, uh, let's break that out a little bit more to make that clear. Okay, and the capital improvement program, similar, uh, yeah, exactly. So under 2020, what you would see in the capital improvement program is the pass through of the dollars for Longs Garden. You would see the addition of those one time revenue dollars from the sale of those two houses. Um, and then in that carryover ATV line, about 8 million of that is, uh, so the majority of that is for the Shanahan purchase because that didn't close until Q1 of this year. So it's. Ah adjustment to base that all of that stuff gets added and so we want to make sure that it's posted in the fund financial so you can see that, um, we can definitely add more clarity to that thank you sure sorry dan oh no problem karen i just wanted to go back a little bit uh on um about when you look at the service area percentages of how we're dividing up uh operating budget in particular um the, um, you're right. It, it, it's hard to tell a master plan story in there, but there is one in there. And even though you look at it and it's pretty well evenly split, the res uh, just so you know, the resource and stewardship area is actually probably the most, most beneficial of what we call service area bleeding. So there's never a project, typically there's not a, a project that fits 100% neatly under one service area. And so, for instance, a number of trail projects, and Jarrett, you're probably going to either shake your head that I'm way off or not in your head. <laughs> Jarrett's space up there so we can see. <laughs> yeah, but that's the great thing about this. It's about <laughs> half, the, half the trail projects in a given year are actually trail projects that are um, going to be, you know, carried out by the trails and facilities groups. But a big reason why they're being done is for ecological purposes, and that might be the driver. And so yeah. it's hard for us to present a graph, say, yep, this is the master plan story. This is because more than the resource and stewardship area is actually the most beneficial of, of service area bleed. So Lauren mentioned that a big percentage of uh, um, the uh, community partnership service area is rangers. Well, you can imagine that the rangers are involved in resource protection and all of that. So while it has to fit <laughs> from a budget standpoint under a particular service area, it impacts other service areas as well. So we're, we're trying to figure out a way where we can plan <laughs> story better through our budget. And we're not there yet. Other questions? for Lauren or other staff. I have just one more um, on the, the fund financial. Um, it, it looks like we're finally gonna get reimbursed by FEMA, which is exciting. <laughs> is that for sure or is that just moved over and maybe? 
<laughs> no, uh, it's as sure as we can be. Um, okay. Not very. So we were giving you with Joel Wagner uh, from the finance department. He was our, our coordinator for, for FEMA throughout the flood. And we look at where things are that we've submitted for reimbursement in terms of the overall queue and how many days we've been waiting for review and all of that. Um, so work is, is actually happening. Uh, we still have about uh, 0.5 FTE in an open space that's dedicated to doing FEMA paperwork. So we're, we're still working through all of that. Um, but we worked with Joel to set what we think will happen over the next several years in terms of reimbursement. Okay, and, and my, my more substantive question has to do with the long-term office space. Uh, can somebody just describe current thinking behind the uh, half a million starting in 2022 and going on out? Yeah, I can start and then maybe uh, Dan or others can chime in. Um, when we moved to the hub, we negotiated a five-year lease. And so part of that is understanding if we would need to negotiate a lease extension to stay in our current space. Um, what we're looking at now across the city, especially in light of COVID, um, is different creative ways to accomplish our work. A lot of offices will be remote for a very long time. Um, so are there different opportunities that we might have to, to work across the city um, to meet our, our space needs? whether that's housing folks from other departments or, or vice versa. So I think we just, we're trying to signal that we'll need to be looking at it again. We're, we're a couple of years now in the hub and, and the, the remaining three years on our lease will go very quickly. So I um, want to make sure we're prepared for that. But Dan, I don't know if you'd have anything to add. No, that's kind of perfect. It's just um, an insurance policy down there, if you will. It's, it's, it, it's not only signals to us that, you know, some decisions are going to have to be made over the next five years. But some of those decisions may uh, result in uh, uh, needing to make uh, in, in investments and, and instead of hitting one particular budget year, uh, uh, this would be a way where we could potentially soften the blow on whatever strategy, if there is a strategy we all agree and land on, that would require a, uh, a more significant investment. But uh, So it's just a placeholder for now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Well, Lauren, as always, thanks for a great presentation and thanks to your staff uh, for being able to generate all these numbers under changing situations. So um, I think what we are gonna do now then is to take a break. I think it would be good to get our eight o'clock break in before we go on to 4B, which is the management review of uh, OSMP irrigated ag lands overlapping with prairie dogs. Dan, if that makes sense to you. Let's do it. Okay, so I'm gonna say we're gonna be back at about 12 minutes after eight. That's about a six minute break. So we are in recess at this point. And board members, a reminder, you probably wanna mute your mics while you're on break. I don't know, what are they planning to do? <laughs> you just don't want to end up on uh, YouTube or something weird. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you, Allison. Thanks.
Okay, I am seeing the board back. Dan, I want to make sure you have your staff that will be presenting on Prairie Dogs. There's John Potter. Hi, John. Hey. And there's Mark Gershman. <laughs> okay, so uh, if we are ready, then I will pass it back to you, Dan, for the next item. Yeah, we, uh, we have a brief presentation just to uh, kind of refresh everybody of where we're at in the process. Uh, we got interrupted uh, with COVID and things got delayed in terms of council consideration, uh, but we're uh, just providing this update based on the last time uh, the preferred alternative was adopted by the board was in early March. We're due to go to council soon, so we thought it would be a, a, a good opportunity just to update you all on what's next. And so I'm gonna turn it over to John Potter, our resource and stewardship service area manager, who I think will also introduce some other folks involved in the project. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so that was a great introduction. I'll just add to it that we, we have um, Andy Pelster, our Ag and Water Stewardship Supervisor, Heather Swanson, the Ecological Stewardship Supervisor, and Val Matheson, the Urban Wildlife Conservation Coordinator from the Planning Department here with us tonight to support um, Mark Gershman, our senior planner, who will be giving a brief presentation. And uh, we're here to uh, address any questions that you may have uh, regarding this item. So, Mark? Great, well, thanks, thanks John. And, um, and uh, Dan, you're absolutely right. If, uh, Lee, if you move to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, great introduction. Um, and uh, did wanna make it really clear that a, a, an effort like this um, that, as Lindsay has said, has been going on for a little bit over a year now, um, involves a lot more than just the person talking to you at a meeting. Um, we had a lot of community members uh, involved in this, including council and the Open Space Board. Um, but the project team itself includes Allison Eklund, um, who is our, <clears throat> excuse me, our community relations officer. Val Matheson is, is online, as John indicated, and is our uh, senior Urban Wildlife Coordinator, Andy uh, online, you've heard from him earlier today, um, as well as John, Tori, um, and Heather, who is online, I think from a distant location, who's our Ecological Stewardship Supervisor. Also like to um, just acknowledge the contributions that Dave and Karen have made um, representing the board uh, on process related matters. It's been really useful, especially over this uh, bit of a hiatus we've had due to the pandemic. And also like to uh, recognize Bill Yates, who's done a lot with social media, communication, uh, website management, uh, Kendall Ryan and the GIS team, Christian Nunes and the other wildlife ecologists, um, Aaliyah Case, um, it's been, well, you know Leah, she just does everything. Um, and then we had help from Janet Michaels and Deb Kalish in the city attorney's office. Um, I, I jumped over Tori Poulton. Tori has been sharing a lot of amazing input, doing a lot of the data analysis. She's our um, Prairie Dog Conservation or Stewardship Coordinator, and uh, she's just, it's been fantastic. Um, as you know, because you've heard from Rob Alexander, we've also worked with other members of Boulder County Parks and Open Space and other agency partners who've been working on Prairie Dog Management. So big project team. So I wanted to take a little bit to uh, acknowledge the input of a lot of folks um, and the community, especially on this project. Yeah, the next slide, because me clicking doesn't do anything. <laughs> um, the, purposes, uh, the purposes of this update um, are just to refresh folks' memories about where we were, um, where we left off before COVID, as, as Dan said, um, and what's been happening in the interim, and then just uh, to talk a little bit about the uh, City Council public hearing that's scheduled, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for August 11th. Next slide, please. Um, to recoup, uh, we um, got direction uh, from the board or the recommendation from the board in April of last year and then direction from city council in May, um, recognizing uh, that conflict uh, associated with prairie dog occupancy on irrigated agricultural lands managed by open space was causing us some difficulties in meeting the uh, open space charter purposes associated with agriculture. Um, that we're also experiencing soil degradation and loss 
and uh, that our current uh, reliance on relocation and the existing tools that we were using um, was not effective or likely to be effective in the long run of providing us with a feasible or a cost-effective way of uh, addressing the issue. So we got direction uh, from council to undertake an expedited community engagement process uh, to look at a variety of agriculture and ecological conditions on the land and come up with a set of recommendations about how we could address the conflicts between prairie dogs on irrigated lands um, and consider a variety of other tools, including lethal control, which um, in the past um, was sort of the uh, option of last resort and something that open space had not relied a lot. Uh, a lot. And so I wanted to also uh, mention in the context of some of the public comments that these actions from the board and council came at the very meetings when both the board and council approved staff's recommendations or, or heard staff's recommendations um, on implementing um, 42 of the Prairie Dog Working Group Phase Two recommendations. Uh, the board and council both responded to information provided by staff in the community supporting uh, staff's recommendation to begin or to continue to work on 29 of those 42 recommendations and other ways of advancing the remaining recommendations. At the same time, the board recognized, and then council did too, that um, that package of um, recommendations was unlikely to be sufficient to address uh, what they've been hearing from the community and included in the materials that staff provided um, regarding uh, concerns about prairie dog occupancy in irrigated agricultural fields. And so based upon, um, based upon that recommendation, um, we move forward. I, I also wanted just to uh, put some of this in context. Um, both uh, the Prairie Dog Working Group um, recent recommendations and this project uh, are good examples of adaptive management. Um, this, this work is a part of an adaptive response to the fact that everything that we've developed in our most recent Prairie Dog um, and grassland management um, hasn't been working perfectly and that we need to make adjustments. Um, the overall context for this started in the 1970s when we had an, a prairie dog control plan, evolved in the 80s to a prairie dog management plan, uh, evolved in the late 80s into a prairie dog habitat conservation plan, and in the 90s we got our urban wildlife management plan and uh, the wildlife protection ordinance in the 2000s, and then in 2010 um, the development of the grassland ecosystem management plan, um, and then the development of the um, agricultural resource management plan in 2017. All of these projects um, have been uh, adaptive responses and improvements in our ability to build a comprehensive program for conserving grasslands, including agriculture, including native grasslands, uh, wetlands, riparian areas, etc. So I can see that um, from some of the comments it may appear that this is a standalone project, but um, that, that surely isn't the case. Um, this, if we could see the next slide, please. Um, this slide uh, shows on the um, up and down axis, or the y-axis, acres. So the higher those bars are, the more acres. They're labeled, and I know they may be difficult to see the actual numbers. And then on the y-axis, years, starting in 1996, and there's a pair of bars annually for each year up to 2019. The green bars show the system-wide occupation um, of prairie dogs, or the, the number of acres occupied by prairie dogs each year. The blue bars show the number of acres of prairie dogs on irrigated lands on open space. As mentioned by, uh, I think, Lindsay in the comments, there's no simple solution to managing prairie dogs. But what we are trying to do is to produce a set of uh, intelligent alternatives. Um, and yes, there are going to be impacts to prairie dogs and their associates. Um, um, these are costs that we intend to examine as we're implementing this program over a number of years and find ways to minimize those impacts, providing the best outcomes for both agriculture and the conservation of prairie dogs and associated species. One example uh, for this already is the prioritization in the preferred alternative um, of a number of criteria, including focusing our initial work in the removal and transition areas where conflicts are the greatest. On the other hand, um, what you can see is we have um, areas in green, if you were to remove um, some or a portion of the blue bars, uh, that 
that describe, I think, the extent that we are conserving prairie dogs and their associates in the context of agriculture, irrigated agriculture and otherwise, and, and the six other systems mentioned in the grassland plan. So what I guess I'm trying to say is that we aren't proposing um, to kill all the prairie dogs or remove all the prairie dogs from open space. What we're proposing to do through the preferred alternative is to reduce the conflicts on irrigated lands. And the notion being that, yes, there will be extensive areas that continue to be occupied by prairie dogs. So I just thought it'd be useful to put some of this um, in kind of a context of the level of ex extent of uh, occupancy and the population fluctuations that we've seen. If we could see the next slide, please. Um, Leah. Um, we developed um, and implemented a, a three-phase um, public engagement process that was expedited, um, and that led us um, up to a March uh, 11th uh, public hearing with the Open Space Board of Trustees when the board unanimously made a set of recommendations uh, to modify and improve staff's recommended preferred alternative. Um, the day after that, the city's COVID response began um, and our scheduled public hearing with the city council uh, for the following month uh, for April um, was postponed until now August 11th. Um, in the meantime, though, we did a number of things. Next slide, please. Uh, these included um, taking uh, the time to document and share uh, with the community the recommendations of the Open Space Board of Trustees at the March 11th meeting. These were developed, uh, these were um, developed from the minutes uh, and the recordings of the meeting and then posted on the project website. And if anyone's interested um, in the home audience or anywhere, uh, that is a shortcut to the um, project website that you can see there um, at the bottom of this page. Um, the next slide, please. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. So we took um, these uh, recommendations and we documented them. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. In addition, we also, um, had meetings with a number of members of the community who uh, expressed um, interest in knowing uh, more about what we heard from the board and who had some uh, information that they sought to share with us. Um, initially, the third engagement window was just the public hearings between, um, between members of the community and uh, you as the appointed officials and the council as the elected officials. Given the kind of the unknown timeline till we were gonna get back to council, uh, we thought it would be useful to have conversation um, with community members who had an interest in speaking with us. These are the th three groups who, who did. Um, we provided um, the notes of these meetings online, as well as um, opened um, the same opportunities for any groups or individuals who wanted uh, to avail themselves of the same opportunity to ensure things were fair. Um, we didn't get any other requests. Um, uh, next slide, please. The um, the, the next thing that we did is recognizing that we had some time, the board had given us some direction to evaluate and recommend and come up with um, the um, best ways uh, or the most advantageous ways of moving forward uh, to make the uh, preferred alternative consistent with existing policies. There are two places um, where there was a need for considering, considering um, how to do that. One had to do around um, lethal control, and the other had to do with um, agricultural activities that had the potential uh, to affect or damage um, or disturb prairie dog burrows. And so we, um, we looked at a number of factors, uh, as you can see listed here on the left side of this uh, matrix, and uh, we looked at three primary ways of going about um, that work through ordinance or code change, uh, through the development of a city manager's rule or regulation, um, or through application of a special permit. This information is included in the board packet. And um, next click, please. Um, if you can just give it a click, Leah. Um, and go ahead. Um, the staff's recommendation to city council one more time um, was to move forward with a special permit uh, for lethal control because it uh, seemed to be the most expedi expeditious way of, of moving forward um, and, to, and similarly use the city manager's rule to allow for limited borough 
uh, disturbance or damage. Next slide, please. So we, we started with the um, staff recommended preferred alternative. Uh, next slide, or click. Um, we um, took the uh, recommendations of the board to make modifications of that. Uh, click, please. Um, we, um, we had our meetings with the community groups. One more click. Um, and then uh, we did the evaluation of the ways to um, bring policy consistency. Click again. Um, and that led us to the development of the uh, OSBT recommended preferred alternative that is uh, attachment C to your packet today. Um, next slide, please. Um, the preferred alternative contains these um, sections. I'm not going to go to them in detail. The board's uh, seen this both before. And next slide, please. Um, and then uh, the preferred alternatives themselves are listed. Um, our specific interest here is to get, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, our, our specific interest here um, was to share this information with you to make sure that uh, we were advancing in a manner consistent uh, with uh, the board's uh, direction back in March. And um, next slide, please. Um, as we prepare to move forward to the um, city council public hearing, um, if uh, there are no major changes associated with um, the staff uh, or the uh, open space board recommended preferred alternative, um, we'll advance to city council for their August 11th meeting. If there are significant changes that need to be made, we'll schedule another uh, public hearing before the Open Space Board of Trustees to make sure that there's an opportunity for community input on those ideas and then reschedule our time uh, with City Council for a, a later date. Um, that's um, the end of my presentation. And if you can click to the next slide, I'm just uh, interested in any questions you may have. We've got Heather, Andy and <coughs> Matheson um, online to help answer questions that may come up. <coughs> so board members, uh, everyone's interested in this and uh, thanks to Mark for reminding us the long pathway that it took to get to here, even though it was expedited, expedited. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that staff took advantage of the, uh, you know, the COVID hiatus to keep uh, pushing the ball down the road. So the proposal is to go to council on August 11th with the uh, preferred alternative revised based on our June 3rd recommendations. And so we have an opportunity here to ask some questions. And I, I just wanna lay out what I think is on the table and what is not, but I'm happy to have a discussion with board members about that. I think uh, it is appropriate to suggest any changes that you think are corrections needed in the proposed uh, package to council that would more accurately reflect the board's recommended plan. So if you think uh, the, the current plan doesn't actually accurately reflect what the board recommended, I think that's uh, something worth talking about. Uh, I think also if you are making recommendations for additional material or clarifications in the package that would improve uh, the ability of council to understand it. I think that's also very much appropriate for right now. Um, I think uh, as Mark has said that if, if we're proposing changes to our recommended plan that we made on June 3rd, uh, rather than just corrections to uh, the June 3rd concept, then we will probably have to give up the August 11th uh, uh, meeting with council to get their approval. And so that's, that would be a big step to go in that direction. Uh, but if people need to do that, we can. Uh, there's also a pretty large area of suggestions for program implementation. And if those fall within the existing proposed framework, I guess I would just say those are things we don't need to settle on right now. There'll be a number of opportunities in the future before the program really gets to implementation for us to make continuing recommendations on ways to implement the uh, proposed program. I don't know if that made any sense, but I thought I'd try to lay it out. <laughs> I see a lot of laughing going on. So, okay. Uh, anybody, 
questions about that. Kurt, I think you did a, a great job. No laughter for me, but I would just correct that it's March 11th. June 3rd was South Boulder Creek. Mm. But, uh, you know, it's, it's all one COVID time frame. Yeah, no kidding. Thank you, March 11th. It seems like yesterday, Dan. <laughs> okay, anybody got questions? Let's uh, start off. Hal, yeah, you want to kick us off with questions for Mark or the other staff? And you're muted. There you go. So, so Kurt, we're gonna we're gonna do clarifying questions and then move into a period of comments after that. Is that sort of the vision? I I think we could do either at this point, but uh, yeah, clarifying questions would probably be the easiest right now if you've got something. Great, I've got one clarifying question. Um, on page thirty uh, in the discussion of the city manager rule. Help the board understand how three inches was determined to be the depth of disturbance. Um, oh, it's awfully dark. This is Val Matheson. I didn't realize this would be coming out so dark, but I can take a stab at that. Apologize for, um, give me a second here. Okay, that's better. Um, so I can say what the intent in the three inch depth was and what the staff team was thinking. Um, a lot of what we heard is that the borough damage ordinance was so restrictive um, that um, farmers and in the agricultural context couldn't work in, in the system. So doing things like driving, um, haying, seeding, um, working the land, uh, the ordinance was really protecting the borough in its full capacity extent. So what we were trying to do is think about what are, are things that could happen superficially that wouldn't um, constitute lethal control in an inhumane way in, in a nutshell. Um, and unfortunately, there haven't been a suite of studies of how deep can you go um, into a system before you're really compromising the animals. Um, so that was the context of the conversation of that depth. Okay, Val, was there any um, attempt to bring our leaseholders into the discussion about practical agricultural concerns? Well, I will, I will say in practical agricultural concerns, we were consulting with Andy um, as to kind of what activities happen at what depth. Um, so the, the three inches wasn't an assumption that uh, all agricultural activities would be able to happen as they do at a depth of three inches. Um, but we were consulting on, you know, what are the activities that happen at different depths? Yeah, and I, I can add to that, you know, we, we certainly we're aware that the agricultural community would like as broad an exemption as possible for the activities um, on the leaseholds. Um, but again, as Val mentioned, we heard various perspectives on that from the advocate community, for example, that um, they didn't want ordinance change to become de facto lethal control. Um, so we were trying to balance the various perspectives, uh, but also in looking at where most of the prairie dogs are, um, in conflict with irrigated land, it tends to be irrigated hay meadows um, and irrigated pasture. And in those instances, uh, but being able to level burrows, um, smooth and level fields to uh, reseed and integrate or to enhance an irrigation would be a, a significant improvement to what is already allowed. So, so I, I guess I'll just ask directly then, is it possible to run a hay operation without changing the direction of, of your tractor and equipment at a three inch level? Um, it, haying in itself, the, the harvest activities um, really don't disturb the surface. The sod isn't disturbed in most haying operations. Uh, if a, renovating a hay field, for example, where you're starting over to re the hay field would certainly be an activity where um, they would mold more plow or plow very deeply to do that. 
um, in many of the instances where we have prairie dogs, uh, kind of a minimum disturbance recovery seems to work very well and that that's been our experience in removal so far is that if we simply flatten the burrows um, and interseed into that sod, uh, we do get reestablishment of the hay grasses, hay and pasture grasses. Okay, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there. I mean, I, I trust the staff's work on this. I just know with the extent of the effort and time that will go into doing a city manager rule, given, you know, Mark's great presentation. Thank you, Mark, about what all actually needs to occur on the ground. We just want to make sure that we do it right in a way that actually works or else we're going to be back here talking about it sooner than later. Yeah, and, and that's a great point, Hal. We, we did do some further outreach, um, and I think we would have some flexibility on what that depth might be. Could I, could I climb on before we leave this topic? Um, yeah. Andy, we heard from, for instance, Marcus, that in working the Bennett property, he has found he needs to use a yeoman's plow, um, which goes down deeper than the three inches. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about how you see that happening since we don't want to abandon the work that we've started at, in the, on the Bennett property. How does that fit into all this, knowing that there are prairie dogs there now? Right. Um, that is a good question. Um, we, we, would, we have developed a set of best practices that would help us do that within ordinance. Um, that does not at this point include the 12 inch depth and, and we understand that that's a challenge. Um, I, and I think in some of the areas, the staff preference given um, some likelihood of, uh, you know, some co lethal control that may not be humane, we would do removal and then move forward with those activities if possible. Um, in the case of Marcus and Bennett or properties, we may try to passive really, passively relocate on smaller areas of, of a property so we can implement some of those strategies. So you're saying, uh, just for clarity, I think what you're saying is that on the Bennett property, Marcus could not continue the restoration work and the carbon sequestration work until that property were prioritized for uh, relocation or lethal control. Is that correct? Uh, I, I think it would depend on what the final language is uh, in the rule to make that a determination. If the depth is increased, for example, Marcus and any operator could disturb to whatever depth is de determined in that rule. Um, right now, we are working on the best practices uh, that does allow uh, for sea line plowing in those scenarios. So, under this under this wording, key line plowing would be allowed. Um, yes, to the depth described in the rule, um, and then also to how we would describe the practice in the best practices that we have you know, for implementation. Uh, Andy, Andy, what I wanted to know is why can't we have language that says exactly what you just said, that to, you know, that will be defined by best practices, um, determined by the activity, you know, that's on the ground. I, I just am a little concerned that this is far too limiting and that we ought to have more flexibility in, in you know, kind of how we deal with some of these agricultural activities. And the line plowing, it, it strikes me that for vegetable cropping, three inches isn't going to be adequate. And so we ought to have more flexibility, I think, built into this than just, you know, one standard. And it seems to me that I can't see anybody at this point, so I'm just going to jump in. It seems to me that the purpose of the change to the borough disturbance rule was to give some relief to agricultural activities, recognizing that given limited resources and the number of prairie dogs we were dealing with, that it was going to probably be several years before we got to a lot of the properties. And so 
if we have to do removal first before you get any relief on boroughs, then you know it doesn't really provide, I don't think, the uh, immediate flexibility that we were hoping to give people until such time as we can have the resources to clear their property. Uh, that's my memory, but uh, and, what of other people think and chime in. Well, Kurt, I was just gonna say that um, this is great feedback and I think that staff could go back and look at uh, this language a bit more before we develop the rule. And of course, through the rule process, there would be an opportunity for the public to comment on um, on the language that's in this yeah. clarification. So I just wanted to make Yeah, that. John, that's very helpful. And so uh, right now we know that in the package that describes the amended uh, recommended uh, approach, uh, it talks very in great detail about a proposed change to the borough uh, rule. Are you saying we would not have that detail in, but simply tell council that we're still working on a way to modify the bird destruction uh, ordinance through a, a manager's rule in order to balance these things? I mean, what, how do you think you would uh, change the package to go to council? Yeah, I think we would um, describe more the intent of what we're trying to do here as opposed to the specific language at this point and then bring that forward as the staff team has an opportunity to look more closely at what could be um, a better operational description. We need something in the rule that is really going to be clear on the ground for, you know, was this okay or was it not? And, and that, right. that this was our really our first attempt at it. And uh, I think we could look at it again and, and see what we can do to, um, to adjust that, Kurt. Uh, thanks, John. Any other comments, Dan? Did you want to add anything on that? No, that's my understanding of talking to John and some other team members is that uh, we're, we're uh, learning almost every day through conversation about what this language may look like. And we certainly are hearing uh, your concerns today and um, we'll go back and um, work on that language. Um, of course, if we're going to stick with a special rule, we don't we do not go too far where we're actually better off than looking at an ordinance change. So um, within uh, or, or uh, um, city manager rule. So um, yeah, I th as Matt said, there's flexibility still and exactly uh, what we come up with and we'll, we certainly are hearing what you're saying. And uh, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the uh, concept that we put forward in March, thank you for reminding me, um, it didn't stipulate whether it was a rule or an ordinance. So I, I think you folks are still free under our view to, uh, you know, change course if you think you need to. Is that how you view it too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, Hal, thank you for bringing that up. Is there any other comments on that issue, Dave? Um, yeah, in a similar vein, you know, the language on the, the top of page 14, again, on uh, limiting uh, bureau, bureau disturbance, I have a question um, at the end of that sentence, so long as that damage is not likely to result in the death of prairie dogs. I, I, again, I just, I, I think that's far too limiting. My suggestion would be to put a period after Typ typical or I would suggest customary agricultural practices because um, I'm, I'm not sure how we're going to guarantee that there won't be, you know, the incidental death occasionally, um, you know, through some of these practices. And so I, I think, again, that uh, is confusing and far too restrictive. I, I just want to um, reiterate, I think, kind of a little bit about the process and see if um, Dave, you or other board members might have a recommendation on um, other ways to structure two important points. Um, as, uh, as Val and Andy indicated, one of the things that we had taken away from both the uh, input from the board and the, the public input that we should uh, establish um, a way to allow agricultural activities uh, in, the, in the project area to affect prairie dog burrows. Um, we also had a recognition that um, there was uh, an issue associated with certain types of lethal control that were considered inhumane in the uh, January um, 
materials that went to the community, there was a proposed approach and evaluation of um, potential actions. Uh, among those were a number of actions um, that were uh, evaluated based upon the level of humaneness and um, activities associated with, uh, um, that would essentially bury prairie dogs alive, um, were identified as, as probably inhumane and were not um, considered further in our analysis. So we used that um, as an initial starting point of allowing a borough disturbance insofar as it uh, was unlikely. And, and again, this was kind of the um, reasonable person test um, to result in the, the death of prairie dogs. Um, from that, we said, okay, that's a good starting point, but we are going to be questioned um, at an operational level. And this doesn't belong um, in the preferred alternative about how we would make that determination um, if a lessee or um, uh, one of our own staff were interested in knowing whether an activity would be allowed on these irrigated agricultural lands. And so that's where we came up with um, some specific guidance. What I'm hearing at least uh, from some of the board members is that this threshold issue of lethality or allowing um, uh, the potential death of prey dogs um, by disturbance of the ground is, is not something that we should uh, move forward with considering as a limitation because that may well affect our ability to advance this using one tool or another. And I just want to gain clarity from the board on that. Mark, I think that's a really good point. I think part of the difference, and we can try to tease that apart, is on the one hand, you were talking about methods designed to kill prairie dogs and some that were humane and some that were less. Here we're talking about agricultural practices that are carried out to further the agricultural goals. They're not intended to kill prairie dogs. And then you get into this in issue of sort of incidental but unplanned take. And is that the same as using intentionally inhumane methods for killing? That gets into a gray area. I can appreciate that. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Other I'll thoughts on that, Hal, yes. If it's helpful. Um, I just uh, worry that we do a dishonor to all the time and effort we put into the project to create um, limitations in legal language that prevent the core goal, which is to bring irrigated lands back into productive agricultural use and address the needs of those people there. Um, I believe fundamentally in the department's ability to find the right balance. My concern is, is that by encapsulating it too sharply in the language sort of we've seen, that, that we actually prevent ourselves from being able to make good decisions and become more trapped by uh, technicalities, essentially. Thanks, Hal. Any other thoughts on this issue before we take additional questions? I did, my sense is that this was the biggest concern about uh, uh, by the board about this package going forward to council. So uh, I, I'm delighted to hear you feel like there's still some room to uh, get council's general endorsement of the approach. And maybe, maybe it would be good right here, uh, Mark or Dan or John, to say a little bit more about exactly what you're asking council to take action on uh, in a discussion that I had with you, um, you said, well, they're going to need to say or, or find that this is a um, public interest program or something like that. So maybe you could talk a little bit since we haven't seen language that's going to go into the council package. Yeah, John, you want to handle that one? Yeah. Um the, uh, I know, Mark, you've started to develop some a language for a motion for the council. I don't know if you have that in front of you. I don't. Um, but and my recollection is that um, in order to implement this, uh, this through our, this strategy of a, of, a, of a rule clarification and a special permit, 
uh, we were hoping that the council would identify the need to do this project as a public improvement project, which again, it kind of gets to a little bit to Hal's point about, you know, sort of the, the, the language around uh, how we are able to do things. If, if um, the council agrees that this is a public improvement project that should move forward, then, um, then we are um, able to move to better move forward with the special permit and the, um, and the rule the rule language. Um, I, I can certainly share um, the draft uh, motion um, if that is uh, what. Or if you could just describe it. Did I, yeah. was I close on that or? Yeah, no, I think it's really close that um, the city council approved the uh, OSBT recommended preferred alternative as a necessary public improvement project for the management of city open space because significant prairie dog removal is required to restore irrigated agricultural lands and soil health. So that's, that's where we are right now. That isn't uh, kind of, we're not necessarily for feedback on that, but welcome it. And so the uh, prefer, and so that re refers to the preferred alternative that's in the attachment of your memo tonight. And that would be what they would be approving those um, items in there. And, and Mel but, could speak more yeah. to this, but that, that language was based on guidance from the city attorney um, with regards perhaps more to the um, special permit. Um, yeah, you did a great job just to add, you know, and, and going through the most streamlined process or mechanism, we just look at what do we already have in our current ordinance that accommodates what we're trying to do here. And in in doing that, the special use permit um, is a is a vehicle to do lethal control as it will be described, but the ordinance specifies that it's for a maintenance or public improvement project. So what we were just looking to get from council then is clarity that one, they agree that this is a maintenance or public improvement project, and also that um, the second part of this ordinance, they know about it. I mean, it requires that council has been notified. So that's why it was put into the, the motion language. And with that blessing then, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, the department has the latitude working with the city manager to get approval of the special permit and a rule that would clarify the borough destruction ordinance. Is that right? It's not doesn't go back to council for that approval. Is that right? Correct. It doesn't go um, back to council for approval. The requirement for council in that context is notification um, and that it is uh, a public improvement project. And then I just wanted to separate the rule development is independent of that notification and um, um, requirements that we were just talking about. The rule is a, a city manager rule that requires um, notification, public notification and being posted for 14 days. Thank you. Other questions or comments, folks? Hal. Um, yeah, I just have a couple comments if this is the time. Yeah. Um, first off, I just wanted to thank uh, the representatives from Wild Earth Guardians for joining us. Um, I personally am a, a partner with Wild Earth Guardians in my own nonprofit work and highly respect the organization and count many of uh, their ranks as friends and business partners. Um, I also heard in the comments a description that they felt the government machine was at work here. Um, that sort of hurt me personally because Anybody who knows me knows that I am not part of any government machine. And as a matter of fact, uh, really do represent what I believe to be my community here in Boulder. Um, I know that's not what was intended, um, but I think it's important to understand in the dynamics of this conversation, th there has certainly been no fix in, and there has been very ample debate and deep thought on such a weighty issue. Um, I really appreciated, Mark, your discussion of the history of adaptive management within the context of the, the larger multi-decade landscape here. Um, and also, uh, there was some discussion about provisions for loss, and I just wanted to honor those commenters by saying, in my mind, 
the provisions for loss are well encapsulated in the grassland plan where we've clearly created a corridor where we will define what we describe as a population emergency in, in prairie dog reduction. Um, and so certainly the, the, the losses have been also thought about deeply and I, and I believe provisions considered and made for. Um, I think one of the biggest misunderstandings about this project um, relates to the concept of, of wildness and rewilding, of which I'm a huge supporter. I've supported many wilderness bills and actively pursue in my own private life additional wilderness designation. This particular system and charter uh, does ensconce agriculture and as board members, that is part of our considerations to, to look at. Um, that usage in that community as well. Um, I do think that this plan, while maybe not helpful to uh, certain parties who are seeking to make broader national impact in what I think is a very important discussion about this keystone species, it just isn't working presently for the local community and the stakeholders that are part of the agricultural program and we're trying to weigh where we want to be carefully, you know, in that. Um, I support bringing wilderness type designation to lower altitudes. Um, I support the general direction and thrust being moved on there. But I think this unique study area requires even deeper consideration of, of other elements of the charter, our agricultural community, and the people who do steward the land out there and spend day in and day out on it with practical experience um, with it. Um, I also just wanted to say in closing, I really appreciated the um, eulogy that we heard sort of starting uh, the presentation today, and especially uh, in light of the generous donation of new land, which we received today, this entire system was created through the generosity of individual moments in time where people made decisions to perhaps give up what was beneficial for them individually to create a larger system. And within that, I think um, if those lands have been in use for agricultural uses for many generations, and that was part of the vision of the grantor, that that does deserve some consideration. It's not to say that as we evolve, we can't adjust and change but I do think that that legacy of usage and the intent with the donations uh, are important. Um, last but not least, there was just a mention um, about Delta dust. And um, while I do believe in aggressive methods for rewilding in many instances, I think the use of Delta dust in irrigated agricultural land to move towards rewilding purposes is just too complex and too human engineered for me to fully wrap my, my head around. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking at that point. Um, there was some mention about the plan being lazy. I think uh, patently people will see when they really look that everybody here did their best good faith thinking and put a lot of time and effort into this. And if there's one thing it is not, it is lazy. So thank you. I, I really appreciate everybody who commented. I hope I addressed some of the issues that you had there and what I was thinking about. Them. Yeah, thank you, Hal. Other yeah, Hal, comments? Hal. Caroline? I was just telling Hal, thank you. That was beautifully said. Yeah. It was. Anyone else here? Uh, I, Karen. I have an additional question about the Delta dust too. Uh, my understanding is that it's required um, to get the approvals for the relocation that we're doing. And so there's really no decisions that the city can make about that. Is that correct? Yes, that, to say that's, I'll go ahead, sorry, John. Yeah, that, that is correct, Karen. It's a requirement on the relocations uh, under our state permits typically. Um, and Heather, if Heather's here, she could expand on that, I'm sure. Hi, I am here. Um, yeah, so it, it is required. I mean, I think that the latitude that we have there, and I think some of the speakers from the public, although I don't know for sure what they were referencing, 
we're referencing probably a broader application of Delta dust in relationship to plague, which is um, probably related to development of our plague management plan, which would be a system wide plan that was part of the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations. So those are certainly much larger conversations that involve more than just this study area or more, or more than just irrigated ag. But as it relates kind of to this project, like John said, it is a requirement of the state permit. So I think what we would really be looking at is in our project planning of where relocation would be used as opposed to lethal control, that would be one of the important factors to take into account. So we may have some areas that are not currently irrigated because of either they're not leased or because of water infrastructure um, maintenance needs or that kind of a thing. And so that may be a factor that's important in deciding which, which properties we go to for which technique. So I think that's probably the most likely way that we would address that. Thank you. Other comments before we move on? Uh, again, our thanks to staff. This has uh, been a very long and challenging process in it's not going to get probably any easier, but uh, we appreciate all the work that everybody is putting into this. And uh, um, I remind people that on August 11th, you might want to be in the city council meeting. Thanks board. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, helpful conversation and thanks to all the staff that uh, stayed up tonight to participate and support yeah. John in the conversation. So thank you. We hope Heather isn't seven uh, time zones away. Only one. It's okay. Only one. Okay. Good. <laughs> it's not all that late, but it is a whole lot more humid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dan. Yeah. So uh, our last scheduled agenda item under matters is a COVID recovery. Just to remind you, uh, we went from April where one hundred percent of our meeting was COVID uh, a COVID update. Backing off that and, uh, and then going to a written uh, update. And tonight uh, we're sort of doing a blend of wanting to uh, do a presentation as well as providing more support through a written uh, memo on our COVID update. So uh, you'll get a presentation and, and some voices in the room, mainly led by Mark Davison and Steve Armstead. So I don't know between Mark and Dave who's going to take it first, but uh, you're up. I can take it first. Um, just wait for the slide presentation to come up. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> okay, tonight, yeah, as Dan pointed out, I'll do the update on the high visitation and COVID compliance. Uh, just before I dive in, I just wanted to take a moment to call out the uh, staff, in fact, all staff, not just the staff I'll highlight here, who've literally for the last four months since COVID began, have been working incredibly hard and dealing with this difficult situation. In terms of the front line, we've had the trailhead staff, uh, the facility staff, science staff, along with the COVID outreach team and the rangers. And it's amazing the dedication they've seen, the sense of duty, and frankly, just the work they've put in. It's, it can be relentless at times out there on the front line, especially in 90 degree heat, and dealing with a lot of anxiety in the community. And they've done everything they can to protect the land and frankly provide the best service they can to the public. And I, I think it's just worth taking a note of that for a moment. Uh, next slide, please, Leah. So yeah, as Dan pointed out, we'll focus on uh, three things in the sort of presentation tonight, but it is in your board package under 4C on page 69 is the written COVID update. And I would recommend uh, if you get a chance to take a look at Appendix A, I'm not saying that board members don't read it, but I know you get a lot of reading material. And so under Appendix A is a list of all the different actions the High Visitation Team and COVID Compliance has in terms of what we've looked at, what we've been able to take action on, uh, things that we're still thinking about. And so in this address here, we've actually got a few people uh, available tonight. Dan mentioned Steve's available. There's also Burton Stoner from the Ranger Work Group. There's Lisa Deeroff from Education and Outreach. We've got Jarrett uh, from Trailheads and Facilities, Dion from Human Dimensions, and John Potter, we'll call him back for uh, stewardship questions that you might have as they pop up. But the main three things we'll focus on, and it actually ties really closely to the public comment tonight from, uh, I think it was Julie and Suzanne, uh, asking us to address vulnerable populations. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, what we're thinking about in terms of face coverings. And then I'll just mention at the end, rapid assessments. So if we could have the next slide, please. 
So what I want to do is just talk through with you three options we've looked at over the last uh, couple of weeks. And this, again, it's interesting, adaptive management is the key term here tonight. We've definitely, in terms of uh, the way we think about how we respond to COVID and high visitation is an adaptive management approach. And in this instance, we've looked at three types of actions, and we're going to recommend two that we want to move forward. If we'll show you the third that we looked at that we don't quite think is possible at this point in time. So this first action really does try to what uh, Julie mentioned earlier in the public comment. In addressing vulnerable populations, we thought about the idea of Initially, we were just simply uh, through messaging saying, here's places you can go where the trail's wide or there's less visitation. Under this uh, action, we would take that a step further. We're going to basically look at a series of trails, maybe 15 to 20, you know, this is still early on the boil as it were, and develop criteria um, in order to, uh, for those trails to emerge that would allow folks to find, frankly, a less crowded experience where you can better maintain distance and avoid popular areas. And some of the criteria we're looking at so far are things like, like obvious, obvious ones, like wider trails, less popular trails, it's not multi-use. But we've started to think about other things like there's fewer junctions, lower grades, got the ability to really adequately sign it. That's something Julia, Julia also mentioned earlier. Can it be really clear? And then getting into the idea of time of the day, time of the week recommendations. And it won't be that this would be a regulatory, it would be a recommendation, uh, other folks, obviously would, all folks would still be able to use the trail, but it's the idea that we're trying to focus in on making this a place where vulnerable populations would feel safe uh, and do feel, get that sense of feeling safe to go out and use the trail still. The next steps would be, like I said earlier, to get those trails listed and um, to start implementing the program. Action two is a little bit smaller than action one, uh, but it has this very similar principle. This is the idea of uh, as we move into recovery, education and outreach programs are coming back online. So we'd look at adapting existing programs uh, where there's frankly a, a safer environment to enjoy an education program on open space to learn about nature. And some of the criteria we'll look at are similar in terms of um, quiet areas, low grade, wide trails, limiting group size. So those education programs would give people a chance to go and still enjoy open space uh, working with one of our staff, one of our education and outreach team. And frankly, we hope to bring that program online pretty quick, as soon as possible, maybe in a couple of weeks. The third action, next slide, please. I won't spend long on this one, but this is where we, we, we try to see, could we actually designate like a trail only for a vulnerable population? And we looked at all the different facets of how that might work. And really we came to the point where we actually think action one kind of covers this. And it's what actually, again, to go back to what Julie said, she said, you know, I, I don't want to make it exclusive. It, it would be very hard to make it exclusive and to regulate that and all the difficulties. So we'd prefer to try action one and action two first, not take this one on, off the table, but definitely move forward with the first two and then maybe consider this one later if we're having difficulty with the first two working. Next slide, please. So now I'd just like to cover face coverings. Uh, we know there's been a lot of conversation about that lately. There is, frankly, the important thing to remember is the Boulder County Order. And the Boulder County Order does specify that people must wear a face covering within six foot of another person if they can't maintain that social distancing. And that's something we want to be clear on. It's, the our county order doesn't say wear masks all the time, it's within six foot. And that's what we've been working towards for COVID compliance. So we actually even had a coordination meeting just last week with uh, county folk and the public health department. So we're really looking to review what is our messaging, signs, education on face coverings. And I think we want to make a much clearer message. In the past, we, when we began this, we were really focusing in on social distancing. And now it's a, a bit more of an effort to get to face coverings. And what we've been talking about, for example, is can we get a simple, clear message? And we've heard this from a few people, I think a few board members, a few members of the public staff as well. And it might be something as simple as face coverings required within six foot. And you can see on the right there, we've got the large boards we put up on trailheads, the image there, and there is quite a bit of signage. Can we put that simple message up on those large boards that is really easy to see? And we could have that in English and Spanish. So uh, actually the good news here is we're going to, Jared, I think can confirm this, we could start working the next couple of weeks to get the larger signs out to the public and get the message really clearly in place. 
And then working with our communication communications team, the Rangers and the COVID outreach team, would really be clarifying, unifying that message and making it really clear to the public. One thing I would mention, just as an aside, we just got uh, permission working with the city last week to begin handing out uh, materials and actually uh, face coverings. And so the outreach team have started to do that as of last week. And they're seeing a really big success, not only in the fact that people are access accepting face coverings if they don't have them, but the people who already have face coverings, you see them getting handed out are really appreciative of that effort. And I think that that's an example of the little things we can do that can make a big difference. Uh, last slide, please. So yeah, just to sum up, we did get a question about uh, what are we doing in terms of potential impacts to the system based upon changing visitor patterns and uh, in many respects sort of where we're seeing pulses in the system and increased use. So at the moment, we've got really three main areas we're focusing on. Uh, there is a rapid assessment to look at uh, designated and undesignated trail issues resulting from those different visit use patterns. We're also uh, prioritizing coordinating responses. And this is something uh, John would be able to speak to better than me, but it's the idea of looking at any areas that might need habitat restoration, fencing, et cetera. And we've got to obviously balance that with you know, resources as they allow, but the team is on it. And then finally, um, I just want to point out that as we're moving into recovery, we are you know, in furlough staff coming back. Some of the work we're doing is getting back onto the long-term designated and undesignated trail monitoring. I know uh, Lauren touched on that position earlier in the evening. How can we keep going with that and just basically blending it with the recovery work we're doing? So that's just the main highlights for tonight. And so, yes, if the board has any questions, please, we're ready to answer them. Okay, I can't see the board. If I could get that screen. Thank you so very much. Uh, and thank you, Mark. Uh, really helpful presentation. Uh, let's start. Uh, who has a question for Mark? Just raise your hand. Dave. So Mark, uh, the results of a rapid assessment. So what happens after the assessment? You mean, are you worried that we do the assessment and there isn't any action afterwards? Well, and can you also in the, in the, as you answer that, can you also tell us what is rapid? I mean, how long I, is rapid first? Uh, I'd actually defer to uh, John Potter there. His team has been working on those rapid assessments uh, or Jarrett to respond to that because they've been directly. Yeah, John, I'm sure John can speak for um, resource for trail staff that, that has mean, that's meant that our trails coordinators have hiked every foot of trail and come up with a list of priority projects or a list of projects that we're now beginning to prioritize and start to, to put in our work plan for the coming weeks as our, our crews start to come back on. Um, so we can actually get out and start fixing and doing the on the ground work. Jared, can you give us a sense of where we're at with the overall assessment? Yeah, I, I believe that we're um, three of the five coordinators are done with that at this point and the other two are pretty close. Um, so we have a pretty good sense of what's out there in terms of the, the major issues. Um, I think that the challenge is there's a lot of smaller issues that we're trying to tease apart and see how, how important they are. And then as we get out of the really wet spring, we're starting to see what's going to recover on its own versus what's going to take um, some, some, uh, some, some trail, trail staff time to start working on. And, and Jared, if I could add to that, um, to give you an example, Dave, we saw, um, we started to see some trespass on Flagstaff on the summit in HCA. And we, when we did kind of a a rapid assessment out in the field with our high visitation team, we recognized there was a lot of overflow parking occurring. It was legal, but it was overflow going down the road. When people were getting out of the cars, that's where they were kind of going directly into the HCA. So we've done some really good work. Uh, Lisa Goncalves led that effort. And we're, by working with the county, we're able to actually post no parking signs along that overflow areas, direct people back to the trailheads, and then see a re reduction in the HCA trespass. So these are like little examples of the actions we're able to take to respond directly to some of the issues we're seeing. Great, and Jared, I was gonna ask, so when you're seeing the uh, trail damage out there, are, are we responding yet or are we still, you know, trying to get the crews together and, uh, you know, get, get things operational on the ground? So the, the good news is we have our crew leads and assistant crew leads on who are our veteran, it's almost nearly a fully returning staff. 
Um, so these folks are highly efficient. They know the system, they know what to do. Um, the, the bad news is they're a smaller group than our normal trail groups. Uh, so we're, we're hope, or I guess in a week or two, we're gonna be bringing on our full trail crews. Um, it'll take them a little bit to get through a learning curve and get up to speed, but that's when we can really start hitting a lot more of these problems at once. Um, right now, we just we have smaller numbers, and there's there's a lot Great. to do in the system. Great, thanks. Yeah. And I can talk with uh, uh, Jared and Jim Reeder about perhaps a uh, one of the future near COVID updates, as we can provide some more details on exactly what we're finding and where we're at. So, Great. I made a note here to uh, uh, perhaps ask one of the emphasis for a future update. Great. And the other thing, just a quick follow-up to that, um, and I don't know, uh, Mark, and maybe you or if Lisa's still here. Um, you know, when we have people, uh, you know, on the ground and encountering visitors, uh, we, we do the mask, you know, social distance thing. Are, are we still highlighting, focusing, prioritizing the resource impacts, uh, you know, careful, um, careful uh, use of the area and that sort of thing? Oh, Dave, absolutely. Um, I know Lisa Deeroff's on the line, but um, we've actually, we've got a full, like, um, developed an SOP on messaging, and we've got now 16 staff who are out, the outreach staff out in the field, and they've got a clear message, you know, first of all, we're able to talk about COVID and how we respond. And then there's etiquette, you know, talking about things like single file. If you step off the trail, try and use a rock. Please be aware of resources. Then we, are, we try to build in now a little bit of the education story, leave no trace. And Lisa's team, you know, are experts in that. And we've been able to do some really good uh, opportunities for, at this point, I believe, let me just check the numbers one second. Um, and Mark, I'm just now unmuting Lisa. We hadn't made her a... That's all right. Yeah, oh, in so the last... She able to do it herself. So. Thank you, Leah. In the last eight weeks, Dave, we made uh, over 21,000 contacts. And we are on this, you know, everyone's on the same page with that message. So is the reception to that kind of information uh, pretty good? I'll, I'll let Lisa speak to that, actually, because being on the front line with it, uh, Lisa, chat about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. First of all, I want to say hi to everyone. I have not seen you in a while, and hi, Carolyn. Not yet met you. Um, yeah, I, I've been on the front line since the beginning. I try to get out. I've been to every site. My shift is usually Sundays at Chautauqua, and because I feel like that's where I could have the biggest impact. And doing outreach out there is super interesting. Um, people are very appreciative to have outreach staff out there. When people come up towards me and I'm in that full uniform, I'm already assessing which message they're going to get. Because I can't give my big bright smile like I'd like to give to everyone. I just give that big old howdy. And I instantly see their body language relax a little bit. Here's someone in uniform and they are welcoming me to this incredible system. And then I start assessing. So if there's a dog on leash all over the place, my message to them will be, hey, welcome. So glad you're here. Have you been here before? Do you have a hike picked out? If not, do you want me to help pick out a hike for you? I establish a relationship and then I move into that uh, more pointed messaging. So I'll say, hey, I'm gonna ask that you keep your dog close as you pass people for safe social distancing. If it's a really big group coming up to Chautauqua, big welcome. I have rapport with them and I'll say, hey, by the way, I see some of you have masks. Please put those up if you're within six feet of someone or all the time. And as you pass people, just go single file. Just look up there. You can see that group right there going single file. That makes everyone safe. So that's, that's the sort of dance that we do out there. I'm also looking at my Doppler to see if there's lightning in the, in the background. Um, my goal is to make people love the land. My goal is to make people respect the land. My goal is to make people respect each other. And when you're out there, you're gonna see all these different outreach styles. We, we were actually meeting three times a week in the beginning, brainstorming, new messaging, what works, what doesn't, meeting with rangers, are we consistent? And everyone had their own style and they'd share ideas. And um, should I just mention a little bit about the volunteers that we have out there? Yeah. Um, so we then introduced um, some uh, volunteer visitor ambassadors, and that has been a successful program. We started very small. 
And we, we wanted to be super thoughtful about who we had out there. There are already existing volunteers trained in public contact. And then they went through a really extensive training from online to teams meetings to in the field to one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of de-escalation training. And the volunteers, they're loving being out there, but it's not always easy. So today I had a volunteer a woman came up and was yelling at him about face coverings, super upset. And then the woman started yelling at a family. And this volunteer trained in de-escalation was able to listen, listen. A staff person moved in. They started talking to the woman. The volunteer could then move to the family, check in with them, do some hike recommendations. And then afterwards, we debrief. Um, so I'm psyched to have volunteers. They take a lot of well, worthwhile effort. They are considered non-paid staff, so um, I want to watch out for them. We will, we're already assessing how it's going. We'll start considering if we're going to bring on other already trained public contact volunteers. <coughs> we have a, a number of them. And uh, train them up and see how that goes. So yeah, I think it's been pretty successful. I've been enjoying being out there. Uh, Volunteers are appreciating having the bandanas to pro providing the bandanas. That's been a plus. So that's an update. Uh, uh, Lisa, at the end there, were you saying you're talking about volunteers providing people bandanas? We have a, a whole standard operating procedure around that based upon the Postal Service. And um, they're actually, the staff are handing them out with long tongs. And they're already pre-bagged, yeah. so they haven't been touched for a yeah. week or anything. So. Such a helpful thing, though, when you're encountering people to be able to have a positive thing you can yeah. do like that. Yeah. Because uh, uh, this, as you said, is a very difficult thing to do for our staff and our volunteers because, you know, some of this has been sort of politicized and people tend uh -huh. to have strange views that they bring to this. and. At the same time, we've got a communicable disease and we want to protect our people. Yeah. So anyway, I really appreciate your, your narrative about yeah, how this I, is going. I thought you might want to just kind of hear it from the front yeah. line, what we're doing. We, we did have someone yesterday, a staff person who was yelled at because she was wearing a mask and that took her by surprise. It's just, you can't predict it. So we're, we're doing a lot of training, a lot of de-escalation, check-ins. A lot of SOPs. A lot of SOPs. Yeah. Yes. Please. Well, I, I, I know the board would love to hear more at each of our meetings just about how these things are going from the front lines because that's where it happens. I'm sorry, yeah. Karen, go ahead. Yeah. Lisa, you mentioned Sunday at Chautauqua was your favorite assignment. The 16 staff who have been out, are, there, are they out one day? You know what, Karen, it really depends. So we asked education staff to step in and and some people do not feel safe being out there interacting with the public. Some sure. I'm just know. trying to get a sense of how many people are out where. Yeah. Um, well, we have, so we had over 250 outreach shifts between May 11th and July 5th. Uh, we made 21,000 contacts, over 21,000 contacts. So some of those staff are out maybe four to five times a week. Others, it might be every couple weeks. Those are the people like Dave Sutherland. and. So in any given week, about how many staff days how many are shifts? out? Um, I, we have staff out almost every day. It will just vary from one to five people in that day. OK, and you mentioned sites. What are the sites, or where are the staff? Uh, Chautauqua is obvious to me. Yeah, Chautauqua is number one. And um, I have the sites here, so I could just call them out really quick. Chautauqua, NCAR, South Mesa, Flagstaff, Realization Point, Lost Gulch, Red Rocks, Gun Barrel, Teller, Saw Hill, Wonderland, Mesa, Bobolink, um, Sunitas, Shanahan, Boulder Valley Ranch, Bear Creek, Enchanted Mesa. So that's what, two dozen? Say it again. So that's about two dozen sites? Yes. Uh, 20, yeah. Oh, 20 to okay. 23. Uh, 
We okay. have had other sites that we tried in the past. So that the sites I just called out are from middle of May to beginning of July. We've tried other sites. We're sticking to the ones where we feel like we have the biggest impact. And you coordinate with the rangers on that, don't you, Lisa? Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, some of these sites, volunteers or staff want to stick to, and it's a little bit of, of the communities, they're getting to know each other, which mm -hmm. I'm liking that, watching out for each other. It seems to me that, that the capacity could be increased at least three or four fold before you're making a significant impact on the whole array of sites given the volume of people and the number of places where this kind of thing is needed. Yeah. Is that a correct Karen, assessment? Well, yeah, Karen, I, I think it is recognized that the Boulder open space system faces more challenges than let's say the county open space system yeah. where one of their biggest parks may have only two entrance points. You know, right. Over 254 access points across our system, 109 right. are official. It is a huge challenge, and we admit that we certainly don't have the staff capacity to probably provide the level of coverage that some community members may expect of us. And I think it's the nature of the design of our system, how our system evolved in the urban yeah. backdrop um, that it's providing. Um, so, you know, doing the math, if you, if you come to the conclusion that we don't have enough coverage, we probably will. Right, but I, 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 the only reason why I'm trying to get a sense of, of numbers, a sense of the math, is that, for instance, I haven't seen any staff or volunteer of this kind of coverage at any, any of the trailheads that I've gone to, and they're all in Lisa's list. So obviously, you know, on any given day, it, it's not likely that there's somebody at Shanahan, for instance. But, and there are, there are literally hundreds of people there all the time. I know. And, and so, so th that's all I'm trying to do is okay. get a sense, since I'm not seeing these people, yeah. where are they and what kind of... We are, we are literally, Karen, it's a great question. We're deploying the resources as best we can in the best places we've got. And we're doing our best to anticipate peak times and things like that. Um, 10 to 2, for example, is a peak time. So you can get, you know, meet, greet the most people. But Dan's got a good point. The, the resources, because of the size of the system and the amount of access points, we're always going to be spread a bit thin at this point. Right. And for instance, the other morning, I went by Mesa South at 6.30 and the parking lot was totally full. So, yeah. you know, the peak times are... Right. <laughs> From the time the sun comes up till the time the sun goes down, the old old definition of peak times, in my <laughs> observation, is irrelevant. It's good point. And, and good point. maybe some of the board's interest in enhancing our sign messaging is because we recognize that we're not going to be able to do this all through personal contact. N mm -hmm. Nowhere near it. Uh, on that same point, let me just ask, do we have some very rough guess as to what percent of our visitors are connected to our emails? That's a good question. I'd probably refer to Alison Eklund and Alison might have to say, I'm gonna to have to come back to you with the answer. I'm going to unmute Phil. Oh, How, about, how about that? That's excellent. Right right now, sorry. Sorry. Let me find Phil. Here he is. Hang on, Phil. And, you know, the question uh, obviously is just to get it strategically, where, where are the big holes to fill? Mm -hmm. uh, we can put out the best communications in the world on emails, 100%. but if we're only reaching 10% of our visitors, you know, then we have right. to think about that. So a rough number would be great to have. Right. So I think all told of OSMP specific list, if it's just a rough estimate, it's probably about... 8,500 8, to 9,000 people on all our four different lists that we communicate to pretty regularly. But to your point, it's a segment that's already opted in to our messaging. And so what's really important and as we're speaking with Boulder County Public Health and my colleagues in communications um, is that we're trying to understand, uh, oh yeah, sorry, turn that video on. 
is how do we reach people before they come, right? Right. That's kind of the real key. And uh, so as a part of that, that's definitely what we're looking at in terms of uh, Google Ads. Uh, we're looking at th that option right now uh, in partnership with Boulder County Public Health and other folks. Um, we're looking at, we've, and we're updating our Google web page updates. So about 60% of the city's traffic comes from Google. So if you look at any of our trailhead uh, locations on Google Maps, um, if you search that, it comes up, there's a COVID alert. So we're trying to update all the locations <laughs> that people can find, particularly the most popular locations. So I think more than anything, well, I work in the communication is certainly how do we recognize and, and reach people where they're at before they come. Right. And try to get that message. Uh, just as I said before, our, uh, the interactive web map is incredibly popular. The last I look, it's the fourth most popular web page at the city. So that has consistent web, you know, face covering messaging. Uh, we've updated 40 of our web pages to have and really emphasize face covering messaging. So I think the real priority more than anything is not really so much emails, but how do we reach people as they search and come to visit open space? The reason why Google ads and some, uh, as you connect with that is kind of important is that people are just searching for hiking trails all the time and the data shows that. So the more we can reach people where they're at before they come, I think is probably the bigger priority. Uh, Phil, somebody already, already mentioned the university and how important that will be in the next month or so to reach that group too. Oh, if I could just speak to that, Kurt, we, um, we will be reaching out to the university um, to talk to them. And we actually, Brian Litton, one of the, one, Litton, one of the rangers, works with FIRE uh, already on a program where he reaches out to uh, the students in their various dormitories to give them education on open space. So we see this as a great opportunity to talk about COVID and following compliance uh, through Brian's program. And then also uh, Alison will be reaching out to the larger picture and the university working with the city is gonna be giving a very strong message for students coming back about what's expected. So I think that's, yeah, that we know that's a big issue and we're hoping we can get ahead of that. Great, thanks. Other thoughts, people? Dave? Uh, Mark, I just had Sorry, I just had one other uh, quick question, and I, I don't know whether Burton's still here, but uh, how are we, or are we experiencing a difference in enforcement uh, opportunities uh, given the levels of visitation at this point, or kind of what, on that end of the spectrum then, uh, what, what, what does our enforcement situation look like? Yeah, I'd be happy. Burton is on the line and he can speak. We're definitely still in the, you know, we're trying to use the education mode rather than going to full on, you know, enforcement and issuing tickets as it were in terms of COVID compliance. But I'd ask Burton, is Burton still on the line to speak about this? Did that work? Yes. That work. Oh, okay. Hello everyone. This is Burton Stone, a range of services supervisor. Uh, just when I think I'm getting good at message delivery, I hear Lisa speak. So. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, that said, <laughs> uh, Rangers are actively um, engaging the public um, with those messages um, around spatial coupling, wearing, and um, the, the uh, distancing um, issues. How we have to really operate is with our available staff at any one time is, is we, we – we are, our philosophy sort of has to be um, that we will engage the public as we patrol throughout the system. And so um, that, that's kind of our, how we have to, to operate based on all of the other kind of calls for service that come in for us that we need to respond to um, throughout the day. So, and again, just a reminder of, our, of the way our shifts overlap, that a lot of our morning patrol could be dedicated to um, checking for encampments and those resource concerns related to those issues. Um, and then in the evening after the, the full staff are on during the middle of the day, you could have, you know, three Rangers on um, at any one time trying to cover the entire system. So um, we are not uh, shying away from anything, I promise you. <laughs> um, but uh, it is just a, a reality of, of what we're able to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Um, then how we're able to engage with the public in light of the increasing number of rescues uh, that are occurring. Um, we just were on pace to break last year's record, unfortunately. So, 
And That's Bernard, not great. <laughs> fair, I know. Bernard, it's fair to say you've been working with the county as well and coordinating on their approach and we're in alignment, aren't we, from perspective? Uh, absolutely, yeah. We're, uh, we have a weekly uh, uh, county coordination meeting and um, uh, very much a shared messaging and uh, uh, enforcement approach to these issues. Burton, are you getting any uh, pushback uh, kind of as a law enforcement people? Yes. Um, On the ground. Varies tremendously. Um, and uh, uh, again, um, how you begin your approach with people changes a lot of the dynamics. So typically our encounters go, go very well, but there certainly are uh, some of that. Um, suspicion and angst and those kinds of things come out um, uh, against us from time to time. Are you guys still feeling uh, fairly safe out there? Yes. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, the, uh, yeah, thank you, Burton. Other question, Hal? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, um, Lisa, thank you so much for how you sort of described it and Burton, all the work you guys are doing out there. Um, my viewpoint on this is basically that uh, COVID has brought people's relationships with public lands to a new place and a level of depth and complexity that we never really anticipated. And I think you're really looking in the right direction, Lisa, to evaluate the outcomes of this work on the quality of each individual experience. Um, because people are not heading out to the trails with the thought, let me read one last email or let me look into one last regulation. They're on a Zoom call being like, I need to get out of here and get to the trail. Um, and so I really do think as long as people are having those good positive interactions, that's what's important. And I also think, you know, it's hard for certain members of the public um, public means there's an element of chaos, and I'm willing to accept that we <laughs> get fully wrapped around that. So I just, I just want to thank you guys for being out there and person by person having good interactions. Here, here. Yeah, that's when it's a good day for me. So thank you for saying that. And I would just say that um, the staff work incredibly hard, and and for me to do a three-hour shift, being an extreme extrovert, I am uh. exhausted, and so. You might not see staff out there every hour because we're encouraging the, them to take care of themselves. But I will say, and thank you for saying this, Mark Davison, they, people, the staff are so committed. And, um, and peep, the, the visitors, the mental and physical well-being that you could see coming off when they come down the trail, it's just, it's just super rewarding. So thank you. And I, I'm sure it doesn't come across, but I hope nothing the board is asking about or saying gives any sort of implication that we're not fabulously pleased with staff. We oh. are. And it's just, I think, trying to understand better the, mm -hmm. the burden that's on you and think about mm -hmm. ways to, uh, to address it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. You bet. We appreciate and, that. And there's and absolutely no doubt in my mind that the personal interaction is extremely much more effective than any sign could ever be. Um, and, yeah. and you know, we all, we all documented that and signed that in blood in, on the master plan. Yeah. But that, yeah. That's the approach that we all believe is the future. Um, and and that, the future of the land too. Yeah. That's right. That yeah. we're not, we're, any dent that we make is gonna be on a people to people kind of basis. So I, I wanna right. fully, underscore the importance of of that kind of work and it, it and yeah. hearing hearing both what you're doing and the capacity to meet the need is very eye-opening to me as a board member and that's why i'm yeah. asking the questions that i am is to get a handle on it you guys have a handle on it because you're there every day but without asking we don't have any of the grist to to get a grip on that um, exactly. I, I want to go back to the, the collaboration with the county, which has been mentioned a couple times, because um, I, what I'm wondering, given the, the limited resources in both of our systems, 
and the amount of work you all have been doing to coordinate and collaborate with the county, whether there aren't some opportunities to boost our um, capacity by uh, doing things more jointly. It seems to me the messages that, for instance, were on the front page a few days ago from the county's perspective could, might have easily been a county and city open space message. And I'm wondering if, if there are joint press releases for those kinds of things which are valid messages from both the city and county, like the mask and the six feet and the uh, control of, of, you know, where you are on the trail. Everything that I read in that front page article for the county was equal, it was a great message to go back to Mark's uh, emphasis on the nature of the message, it was a great message. And it seems to me it was equally applicable to county and city open space. So if Phil and his counterpart in the county could literally collaborate in a way that puts both systems on messages that are like that, then it seems to me we get more mileage out of our staffs on both, in both systems. Is that a feasible no, that's, approach? Yeah. Well Chance. said. That's, that, that's exactly right. And um, so um, I think you're right about last week's press release. Um, uh, but I would say that that was probably more of an, an anomaly because, uh, for instance, the press release, the month, the, the few weeks before that, which got a lot of airplay on the radio, more about the natural resource protection. We were the lead in helping to promote that and bringing on the other counties to, to do a shared message. Um, uh, I think we I think it was a missed opportunity last week. Uh, I'll admit that, but I would also say that we are talking daily. Uh, I meet uh, uh, and talk weekly at, uh, at least over the last four months with Eric Lane and Tom Hobie and the other open space directors. And I know Phil does the same from the communication standpoint. So uh, uh, point well taken, Karen. We, uh, I think there was a, a little bit of a joint miss message last week for whatever reason. Um, uh, but I would say that that was more of a, an anomaly because uh, the amount of cooperation that has, has been happening on the communication front has been pretty robust. Um, but I don't know, Phil, if you want to have anything to add to that. Yeah, I, I just want to add that Vivian and I talk probably every other day. We have been tied to the hip since the beginning of this. <laughs> to ensure as much consistency. I've probably gotten to know Vivian more than most of my colleagues. Uh, so just to say that we are we are just communicating all the time. And honestly, to Dan's point, it was an anomaly. A lot of it was related to the city furlough um, and timing was, was, was a challenge for that. Um, but just to be clear, yeah, you know, moving forward, we do work so well together and I'm super appreciative of her help um, and particularly with Chana at Boulder County Public Health. So we are in constant communication moving forward and anything that we do and anything that is put out is sought to be joint at all times if we can. And um, if I could just add to that, Karen, in terms of the county, for instance, Bert and I work really closely with uh, the Rangers over there. And for instance, I mentioned Flagstaff earlier, they were looking at uh, Walker Ranch, and we were looking at Flagstaff Summit, and we coordinated openings and everything like that. Uh, I've Janelle, heard about that from the county. Yeah, it's been great. And then on, even on the volunteer front, Janelle works with Bike Control, because obviously Bike Control goes through our land and their land. And we've really we've created SOPs to work together with them for how the bike patrol can work. So, yeah, we couldn't have more cooperation. In fact, maybe a silver lining coming out of COVID is the level of cooperation. <laughs> and we've all learned to use Zoom. <laughs> yes. I just want to uh, just, if I yeah, could just Dan, add please. one more remark, and that, and and Steve and Mark, you're going to cringe because you've heard this since I've sort of took over this role so many times, but one of my top goals was how we can have more increased presence out on our system. And the silver lining of COVID is it's sort of, uh, we're able to sort of test these different ways of trying to increase our presence on the system. And what do we learn from that? And Lisa does such a good job of doing the debriefing of 
and what we thought might have been an eight week effort by education and outreach staff to provide this, it, it's end up being now three or four months. So now we're asking ourselves, what is sustainable from just that group? What is the role of volunteers? What is the role of the full range of rangering from our seasonal rangers to our temps, our limited commission rangers to our fully commissioned rangers? And we're probably gonna be asking ourselves, is there other capacity we haven't looked at yet for that notion of increased presence on the system to not only help with high visitation in the future, but to look at uh, more on the ground education that's more rooted right on our lands itself. So I know our staff is kind of probably tired of hearing that phrase from me, but that is the number one driver for me, something that I'm really looking forward to debriefing after all of this of what works, what doesn't, what can could become more of a ongoing sustainable look at this, do we want to go to uh, five regions where we're really concentrating efforts and pulling in some resources that concentrated efforts and, and letting some go? Um, so all those questions are in play and something that we're having fun sort of philosophizing about right now. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Dan. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, you know, I just thought I also want to, Kurt, too, is just really thank Mark. And one of the things that's really wonderful is the many different staff and the voices you heard tonight are really reflective of what's happening day in and day out by the coordination between the different interests, the different tools we have. And I think what one of the summations here is there isn't one thing we can put all of our eggs in the basket and say that's the, the right solution. What, we're, what we do, we've known this, what we're even more realizing is it takes the combination and kind of pushing different levers at different times to really kind of continue to have the best impact that we can. And the only way you kind of coordinate, leverage your resources is by the staff being coordinated. That's a lot of the guidance marks working with this high visitation and COVID compliance team and all the different voices from the resource, from the signs, the trails, the rangers, the education that really have to figure out all the spectrum of tools. And so really how that's playing out is because of that level of collaboration and support across that team. Thank you, Steve. Uh, are we okay then to move on here, folks? Looks like it. Dan, you had a couple of other, yeah, thanks to everybody. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks to the board. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, uh, before we turn it over to matters from the board, uh, Kurt, just a couple of very uh, more in, informal um, updates. I just wanted to make note of something that's in your packet and a slight change, and just to make sure we're clear on our process. But uh, uh, Bethany and the real estate services team is, is leading an effort to update our process for how we consider license and disposal requests. That's been a, uh, updating those 25 to 35 year old pol policies and processes that has been on our minds since 2016. I actually, when I first came here, that was one of my first assignments. So we're glad we're finally bringing it to light, but we realized in looking at how we were spacing the conversations with the board that we needed a little bit more space to have uh, enough time for your deliberation, your feedback, and then for us to incorporate it. So we've added one more month onto that process. So uh, what's in your board packet tonight, that we'll be looking for your feedback and your comments next month and, and not trying to take any action next month and then come back the next month after that uh, to take the and, and to put the final finishing touches on it. Since, the, since we've been going with these things for 35 years, adding one more month to do it right and not feel rushed felt right to us. So that was a slight change I just wanted to bring out to you that we've added one more month onto this process, which hopefully you all feel uh, good about too. Uh, uh, thank you, Dan. And I think it will help the public too have time to sort of digest this. Um, I will admit when I went back and read our old policies, I thought, well, this doesn't really cover it. <laughs> so I can sure understand the need to uh, get something comprehensive in place. Yep, great. And secondly, I just would like, uh, we've been trying to do a, a good job of informing you about the Aldo Vump as we learn things. Um, uh, but uh, Steve just wanted to provide a couple of oral updates on on some late uh, uh, stuff we now know about. So Steve. Sure, yeah, let me just, ideally it would be Casey French, our senior planner and the person who's kind of our department lead, but she's 
chosen, which is probably good to take some summertime vacation. And so she's getting some respite. So I'll, I'll kind of cover that a little bit, but know that probably any detailed questions or any follow-ups and certainly you'll see Casey and kind of continuing to, to kind of be the point person on this. Just a couple recent things that are worthwhile just to make sure you're all aware of. And I know we did get out to you some information last week and certainly information went out to the community about the uh, startup of the um, El Dorado uh, pilot shuttle, El Dorado Canyon State Park pilot shuttle, which began over the weekend. Um, and so uh, just to be clear that that is not a pilot we are participating in. So it does not stop at any of our trailheads. There was some initial information that went out that included Marshall Mesa trailhead, which was done in error. And we've you know, worked with the county and the state park to make sure that got corrected. Um, yeah, so, yeah that would just be clear that it is not something we're participating in, but we certainly, you know, we'll learn a lot. And I think everybody will learn a lot from how that pilot moves forward. Another, and this kind of dovetails just with Dan touching base on some upcoming board items and the information in the uh, packet calendar you have about upcoming topics and when they fall up on different board meetings is we do show, and it's really just a, a placeholder for the August meeting, the potential for the um, visitor use management plan for El Dorado Canyon State Park, a draft bump coming to the board for review and comment. And uh, we put that in there because we don't know when, when for sure the state park have that available. Um, and we will let you know as soon as they do. We do know that it's probably unlikely it's going to be August. And so I think the best indication is it'll be later this fall. So you still might see that as a placeholder in that kind of longer term calendar, just know that this is not something that's going to hit us immediately. Okay, that's the best indication we have. So I just wanted to make sure you were apprised that this is not something pending and it's going to be really a, a immediate topic of conversation for the upcoming meeting. Um, but even in saying that, I do think it's helpful just to keep in mind is the next thing that hits us is the conversation in your chance to look at the, the draft bump is just to keep in mind that there is a broader kind of anticipated steps around the whole further process that has to occur with assessing the potential El Dorado Canyon to Walker Ranch um, multiple use trail. And so the bump itself, um, you know, in terms of the state parks guidance around it was, did include some discussions around the, uh, the potential for that trail connection, but really that was to look at, uh, do some additional analysis and study just to the potential effects of the context of that trail in also relationship to the current levels of use, potential future increases in use, the current types of activities occurring in the park, potential for future uses, the tools they're thinking and talking about through that bump process that help to manage the use levels and the different activities. So it was really just kind of fact gathering and understanding it all within the context of the state park and of the boundaries of that state park. So, you know, we don't know what the draft bump will actually be. We'll see that when we have that available and you'll be able to understand that. But I also just want to shape that, you know, we have a commitment in terms of um, after the bump process is we'll continue to move forward with the process outlined, you know, outlined before the bump really kick, kicked off to continue to work towards a comprehensive proposal around the assessment of a potential north route and, and no action alternative that the Board motion from fe February of last year provided some pretty good detail of what is necessary as part of a comprehensive proposal. County commissioners and their feedback back to the county staff, their general you know, interests there aligned with the need for this comprehensive proposal. So that proposal will probably, again, likely include things like um, what we're looking at to make sure we're addressing capacity issues related to access and issues affecting the state park and the El Dorado Springs surrounding community. You know, we know we need to do further work to assess the actual on the ground alignment potential for that north route, which is gonna also allow us to do much more detailed environmental understanding of the effects and the impacts, as well as to be able to look at um, the consideration around how do we help make sure um, we're addressing the potential for uh, visitor conflicts amongst that along that trail as, le as well as maintain a, a positive experience for all types of activities. Um, and so I won't go into the details or reiterate the, the motion, but that's again, some of those things that are gonna have to be packaged together as part of a, a comprehensive proposal that eventually will come back to you all as well as the county 
uh, Parks and Open Space Board and the commissioner certainly for any further conversation. What we learn out of the pilot shuttle and also what from is kind of brought out of the bump is certainly going to help inform some of that comprehensive package, but the bump itself is not the complete piece. That's just a piece that was really important for the state park to go forward. So as, as we move forward through this process, we'll keep you informed of what we know, certainly about the timing of the bump. We'll to continue in upcoming meetings update here's the kind of the broader steps and what we know about and try to be as clear as we can about how we move that broader process forward after the bump and uh we'll just keep making sure you all and the community has a clarity around those so, just any, to put that in context for the board group. thank you steve any questions for steve on that i know we all appreciate uh, the work you do to try to keep us up to date it is a could be a bit mysterious at times. So, yeah. um, okay, uh, Dan, did you have anything else? It's back to you, Kurt. Okay. Uh, uh, Dan, Dan, I thought you were going to say something about the retreat. Oh, uh, I could reiterate. Um, uh, I I put an email out to each of you. I believe it was earlier this week, uh, later last week, that uh, the retreats sort of subcommittee made up of Kurt and Hal, Steve and myself and Leah. Right. Uh, we, have a, we have a meeting that is convened, uh, planned for next week. And so I know some of you had the opportunity to provide us with some ideas for retreat content. That was before COVID. So I just wanted to let you know that we are gonna be meeting and starting to get into the details of what the retreat looks like. So if you have any new thoughts that you wanted to convey to us, to please email me. As, um, as Kurt said, that seems like it was probably five or 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is, I agree. Is there a chance that you could send that list back to us so we mm. could say, oh, that was stupid. Why did we think those things were important? And then, yeah. we could, then we could give you what we think are important instead, if we could see the- Sure, I'd be happy to just put a uh, uh, cut and paste all uh, I know not everyone commented, but I think two or three of you did with some ideas. I'll cut and paste what you all are saying and, and get that out to you this week. Great, that'd be great. And could you also say just a little bit, because the last time I don't remember which board meeting, um, there, you said something about uh, the city isn't allowing any in-person meetings. Do you have any sense of when in per, an in-person socially distanced gathering for a retreat might be able to happen? I could have John and Brian uh, get back to to see what kind of definitions that is um, and what, what is defined by a meeting and whether or not that would affect our retreat. Because what I heard pre-COVID is that sort of having a dry end meeting was less desirable than something where we could get out on the land <coughs> And, and, and talk about. So right there, I think we're going to finish into that, Karen, because... Yeah, well, at this point, you know, there may be an option of having an in-a-room socially distanced meeting in lieu of the kind of thing we were thinking about six months ago. Yeah. Um, let me work on um, uh, folks that serve on our city recovery team to see what kind of definition is currently running right now with, with that quote unquote restriction and, and what might happen with that. That'd be great, thanks. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, I think then that takes us to matters from the board and the first one is the Greenways Advisory Committee, Dave Koontz. Unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick check in with the board. Uh, the Greenways Advisory Committee has a meeting scheduled August 19th to go over the 2021 budget for the Green Race pro program. And so the memo came out and I just wanted to check with uh, members of the board if you have any questions or concerns about uh, what's happening with the Green Race program, um, you know, where, where they're headed and that sort of thing. I will be happy to uh, bring those up during the course of the meeting. Uh, just as a quick summary, uh, the 2021 focus uh, for the budget and the, the work plan is basically basically a Gregory Canyon Creek restoration. Um, 
and it's within the uh, city limits. So for 2021, there aren't any uh, greenways projects that are scheduled to occur on open space properties. Uh, having said that, though, um, it's worth an opportunity just to come back and, and say you have some concerns or then I have a question to John as well is if uh, staff has any concerns or comments, uh, I'm happy to take those and convey them as well. Um, real quickly, the, the annual budget for the Green Waste Program is about $346,000. Uh, they look like they're emphasizing the stream restoration um, and some wa water quality and, uh, um, you know, 10-year flood mitigation as far as the project on uh, Gregory Canyon Creek is concerned. And I think in the next five years, that's basically where they're headed kind of creek by creek th throughout the system. Some of that work uh, in out years may be uh, on open space, I think in Elmer's two mile, uh, for example, uh, there may be some work um, that's done there. But right now, uh, the focus is on um, Gregory Canyon Creek um, within the city limits. So if anyone has any comments or thoughts, I will certainly appreciate hearing them and convey them uh, to the committee when we meet in August. Thoughts for Dave? Anybody? Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Dave, will you will you have an agenda at some point for this meeting, and maybe you can just distribute that as a reminder to people to get you thoughts and reaction. Yes. Yes. Cool. I uh, the agenda usually comes out like a week before, hmm. so uh, it will probably be a somewhat tight time frame, but uh, I will send it out to the board as, as soon as I get it. Okay, Karen. Um, it was really interesting to me that the, the uh, materials that were sent out kept talking about habitat protection and conservation sites. And then the photos show a totally bulldozed creek bed. Um, so in my mind, the kind of opportunities that seem pretty obvious uh, with the, the kind of creek bed restoration that you've described and the mention of, of tree loss due to emerald ash borer, it seems to me that the opportunities are to get serious about using some native plants that are not cultivars that are actually native species um, in these restoration projects. And I don't know to what degree the people who are working on this um, have a background and interest and ability to do that or not, but that that's that's the kind of opportunity that I'd like to see encouraged. I, I think that some staff uh, ha have worked over the years with the Greenway staff and might be able to just update us on what's happening as far as their working relationships with the Greenways program. No, John, I can hear, but John, yeah, I was just, sorry. Hi, Dave. This is Darren oh, Wagner. Hi, hi. I was just going to start, but obviously, John, I know you can speak to this directly too. Um, Marianne Gialetto is is one of our uh, two staff. Don D'Amico being another one who, the two of them have worked closely with the Green Waste programs uh, over the years. I know that in the case that you were just describing, Karen, where there are shared objectives, Marianne, for example, works very closely with cottonwood regeneration on those projects. Um, and, and working on the, the native stock available to support those. So um, while they're not always on our property, we do share objectives and staff expertise. Yeah, I noticed the cottonwoods and I kept saying to myself, and, and some shrubs and some native grasses and some, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think over the years, uh, the working relationship between the open space Mount Park staff and the Greenway staff has gotten a lot better. and. I will say I do think that the Greenway staff is trying to look at more ecological approaches to stream restoration and flood mitigation. And so um, I'm sure the open space staff's contributions are very helpful in those efforts. And those staff certainly know what's appropriate in a wetland and creek bed. Right. 
but I agree the pictures <laughs> <laughs> pictures don't convey that <laughs> the pictures lied to the narrative that's for sure <laughs> but uh, hopefully hopefully uh, pictures next year will be different right thanks so, Dave Any, anything more for him Dave no and uh, if People have concerns, uh, you know, after the, this meeting, uh, you can just email them to me and I'll report back uh, probably at our September meeting. Great. Thanks, Dave, for serving uh, on that. It's uh, an important link within our city. You're welcome. Okay. Um, the next item is an update on South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. And there are two parts to this. The first is council's action related to the upstream analysis. And the second part is uh, the package of all of our previous, all of our previous motions related to South Little Creek flood mitigation projects. So let me just start with the first one, give a little bit of a recap of the history and then pass it to Dan to see if he has any additional things to say. So at our June 3rd meeting, I think it was June 3rd, not March 11th. Um, at our June 3rd meeting, we passed three motions uh, giving our suggestions and input to council regarding uh, the flood control project uh, for South Boulder Creek. Uh, one of the things that council did in addition to adopting the 100 year flood protection level for variant one is that they also approved our suggestion to do some additional analysis on the upstream option under the guidance of the city council CU South process committee. Um, on June 25th, I had an initial discussion with Joe Tadeucci, head of uh, utilities, about uh, one way to start bringing together staff or members of both RAB and OSBT to create a working group and maybe start putting together a scope for this. Uh, but that's really been the only thing that uh, discussions I've had. So, uh, Dan, if you have anything more to add to update us. Yeah, just I, I think two main points. One is to maybe uh, uh, calm some fears that individual trustees may have that the clock is ticking and that every day that we're not doing something about it eliminates a day that we could be. Um, that's a weird way of saying that, but um, I just wanna confirm uh, in my conversations this week with utility staff, with Jane, checking in with um, both Rachel and Sam, that the expectation is that uh, uh, Right now, the time frame we're working under is we want to be able to complete this analysis in 2020. So we want to get this done um, this year, um, if that's at all possible. But um, the fact that there's been a few weeks lapsed already since the 16th and you haven't been involved in anything doesn't mean that we've lost those weeks. What you know, however long this process takes is what it will take. So don't feel like because the last couple of weeks uh, you haven't seen any action that that eats away three weeks that was only available to us to do that. So uh, I, I got the confidence, Sam, that um, the clock isn't ticking. We hope to, we, we wanna be able to do this expeditiously, but uh, the fact that a couple of weeks have gone by doesn't take away those couple of weeks from this effort. I kind of hope I explained that somewhat well. No, I know I didn't. Um, <laughs> secondly, is I think we're getting a roadmap leading up to uh, um, August 14th, uh, uh, a little bit clearer. And I just wanted to pass along um, some things that I feel comfortable saying at this point based on conversations that were held today. Um, so August 14th is the next process subcommittee uh, of uh, which uh, the council has appointed uh, Mayor Weaver and Rachel Friend uh, to serve in that capacity to look at the process and the community engagement uh, elements of this side of the project. And basically the council has uh, entrusted that group to kind of uh, come up with um, what this process for uh, the upstream analysis uh, will look like and they'll report back to council. And so we the, sort of the phase one is right now and ends on August 14th, which is developing the scope and the timeline and the parameters around the upstream analysis. 
and that will be presented to the board or to the process subcommittee on the 14th. I did learn today that uh, the process subcommittee will want to shortly thereafter touch base with council to make sure that what they've endorsed as the, the, the scope is indeed what council is comfortable with. So there'll be that initial step right after the 14th of, of Rachel and Sam presenting that back to the council to make sure that, uh, that everyone is sort of in alignment. So August 14th is a, is a pretty important day out there. And so the question is, is where do, are we now and, where, and how do we get to the 14th? And what um, we are suggesting that uh, the board chairs from Open Space Board of Trustees and RAB, as well as one additional appointee from each of the boards, uh, uh, provide staff, uh, uh, will make up sort of an advisory team to the staff in the development of this scope that we'll present to um, um, process subcommittee on the 14th. So the last thing we want to do as a staff is to develop a process and to look at what the scope of this is and to look at what the parameters are and to what the questions we're going to be asking ourselves and to have that scope itself not meet the expectations of the board. So we feel like by having uh, this advisory team that we that staff can touch base on routinely throughout the next five weeks uh, will uh, sort of provide us all with um, a spirit of working together on this and that, uh, <coughs> and by the time we go to the process subcommittee we feel like a lot of the sort of the details have been worked out and that what we're presenting to the process subcommittee uh, is indeed going to meet expectations. So um, this is all sort of, it, it's, it's in line with what Kurt was with thinking. I was thinking the same thing independently. Joe was thinking the same thing. We checked in with Jane. Um, she's in alignment. Uh, had brief conversations with Sam and Rachel who think that that's a, that's a good concept to run with. So I'm here tonight to suggest that we make that appointment and that a week from Monday, Joe Tadeucci will be reaching out to RAB to do that same thing. And that once we get this advisory team in place, uh, uh, we will be, we'll all right, well, as soon as they're in place, we'll put some placeholder dates uh, in place over the next few weeks where we, staff can then touch base with the team uh, to get advice on what you all are thinking about and reacting to what we're coming up with. And Dan, I'm looking at the calendar for August. One useful thing is that uh, that means this working group or whatever it is, uh, will be able to come back to the Open Space Board of Trustees on the 12th to give a bit of a presentation and get board's input before it goes to the process committee on the 14th. We might be able to work that out. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the roles that this uh, two-person team could be is uh, to do whatever communication link you think is appropriate to inform your board, which could be an inform at the August 12th meeting. Um, if there's substantial changes that differ from the representatives that the full body has, there may be some challenges of how much that can be incorporated within 48 hours or, yeah. or the, uh, the reps may want to make a point to subcommittee saying, and here are some of the other ideas outside of this plan that the trustees have come up with. Right. And they have things that are either in alignment with the OSBT or maybe different. Or, so there could be some challenges at the very end of this process, but I think right. overall, I think it could be, a, a, I think it could work really well. Uh, any other questions for Dan before we uh, take up the matter of the uh, additional member of the working group advisory. Hal. Yeah, I just, you know, I, um, the upstream issue has never been a, a major focus of mine, I, but I certainly understand the motivations. And when I hear people use the word scope of the project, it sounds like we're talking about the size of the analysis when at least what I'm reading and hearing from my co-trustees is it's more has an analysis that prioritizes the city of Boulder citizens' financial interests 
without consideration of anybody else's interests been done in good faith. It's not about scope or magnitude. It's about intent and motivation. Can you say a little bit more, Hal? I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm got your point. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I, I, let me think about how I can be more clear. Um, in my mind, and I could be wrong for what other people are thinking, this isn't a project of make work where we decide what, what is the scope of the project. It's more have we reached the intent which has flood mitigation been looked at in a way solely thinking about how it impacts flood prone areas of South Boulder Creek and the citizens of Boulder taxpayer and ratepayer concerns about that <clears throat> problem without influence from other actors so that we have fair and full information about what the land can and cannot support. So I, I just want to clarify, that's what it's about, at least if I'm using my ears right. And I think, um, in fact, you have this in your packet. Uh, you can go back and review our June 3rd motions. I think the way we framed it there was the upstream analysis, particularly to look at, are there feasible ways to avoid having to put uh, a flood wall along US 36 on open space land in the state natural area. Um, so I think that was one of the key objectives in the motion. Other comments, uh, folks, before we... Okay, well then I'm gonna, I'm proposing, since I guess this is in my purview, uh, this advisory group will be um, the RAB chair and myself and I would propose, based on longevity on this issue, that Karen be the other member of the advisory team here, if, uh, if that's okay. And we'll have to talk, as we've, as we've been discussing, we'll have to talk about uh, ways to keep the board informed that may be on a more frequent basis than just our monthly meetings. So, yeah, thoughts? I would support that nomination. Okay, great. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Dan, do you need more from us than the two names at this point? Well, just because it, it, we may frequently run a reach out to this group once or twice a week, uh, just Kurt and Karen, if there's any sort of days of the week you already, you can inform us right now that aren't going to work, or is there any type of scheduling conflicts we ought to be aware of? The second Wednesday of every month. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah, stay away from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm writing that down for, that I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I think we I can be pretty flexible. I can't think of any other regular meetings, but, you know, right. I, have, I have some other appointments here and there, but uh, my schedule's fairly open. Okay. Thank you, Dan. I can be flexible. Great. Okay. Uh, the other uh, sub-item here, um, working with Dan and with John Potter and others, we put together a, a compilation of all of our motions related to this project because they span three years and they span very different contexts and aspects of the projects. And we felt it would be useful for all of us, but also council, if all of those motions were organized under topic area. And so that's what was sent out to you in the packet. Um, if everyone, is okay with the packet and we can take suggestions for modifications and corrections, uh, I would propose that then that be transmitted to council the best way that uh, Dan thinks can be done. Anybody have reactions to or corrections to that package? There's Karen, hi. <laughs> I found a typo on page five um, it was a sentence that didn't make any sense to me, and I looked up the original, and it's, it's, it's a spelling, it's a word doc change. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's in the second, this, by the way, this is a masterful piece. I just, making this happen, I know, took hours and hours and hours. Um, in the middle of the page, the flood wall design 
uh, that maintains the existing groundwater regime supporting the wetland and wet meadow habitats uh, su subhead appears. The second paragraph after that, the third line ends in cannot be compensated or, and it's not of feet, it's offset. <laughs> Very good. By higher mine lands or by anything other than blah, blah. Yeah, good catch. Um, the only other thing that I have a question about is, uh, Kurt, in your original uh, draft of this document, you made it a point of putting some context with some of the uh, statements. And, and I found that missing um, in this compilation. And let me give you a couple of, of concrete examples. Um, on page five, the second paragraph, um, it, talk, it, it says OSBT requested the engineering plans and modeling analyses show blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and this uh, recommendation or request was about things that should be considered before a disposal motion is considered. And I'm wondering if that kind of lead in shouldn't stick with this recommendation. Another example on the same page, item F, the things under there have to do with as you can see, it's a, it's a 2018 statement. When the flood wall and underground water conveyance system um, was to be constructed on the CDOT right of way, then we thought all those things. And those things weren't in isolation. They were based on the fact that the flood wall and ground conveyance system were gonna be in the CDOT right of way. So, and I have a couple of others like that, but I, my question is, shouldn't the context for those kinds of things be part of the words? You know, it's a very good question, Karen. And so what you're pointing out here is that when we organize these things by topic, we are necessarily taking elements from multiple years motions and each of those years motions had a context with it. Uh, like you said, the 2018 motions were all based on a project that had the flood wall on the CDOT right of way. And that introductory context, you're right, it does get lost here. Um, yeah. And, and for example, some of the questions that these motions are in response to were I think those things, the questions are also not there. So I, th I think the reason for that is, I think we, and again with uh, Dan and John's help, we were trying to put together something that was so strictly limited to motion language that there wouldn't be disagreement about what it should say. I mean, you're going back to the language, but you lose some of the context, you're right. So. Um, Kurt? Yeah. Um so that's why we did include the opening um, monologue or <laughs> pre right. is we described the date of each motion and the main fact of the timing of what was being proposed at that time. So right away up front, we said the July 2018 motion, that was when the flood wall was to be constructed entirely within the CDOT right away. Then we made a note on September 11th that that's when the flood wall moved onto the OSMP lands. And then on June 3rd, made another notation to provide some context to everything that's gonna be below that. Whether or not we could maybe, to get to Karen's point, somehow link the, those asterisks on those particular comments back to some of these uh, particular uh, points that Karen brought out you know, how can we link that back to what was the condition at that time? Because I also see it 
the challenge that existing of just providing the recommendations separately like we have been. Here's the 2018. I think at that time it's, it's, it gets lost too of what was the condition of the as well. So, um, or what was the uh, project components related to the right of way or outside of the right of way at that time as well. So I think inherently we've got that issue. Yeah. In and so look at this preamble we developed and maybe how that preamble could be carried throughout more of the document. Uh, I think There's the other-, other there, Let me give you one other example because it, it's good to think about in yeah. the context that we're discussing this. And that's on page seven where the, um, Kurt, your 8320 motion is excerpted. And, and it's a standalone statement about under any of the proposed versions of variant one, it will be critical to blah, blah, blah. And the motion actually said, if council ultimately chooses to proceed with any of the proposed versions of variant one, which is a, a little bit different. Yeah, I, I would agree that that, that the language you just read was part of the motion. Yeah. And so it should not be missing from here. Um, so that's a very good point. S similarly, and you raised this in your initial comments, <clears throat> and I'm going to page Well, page two, it says for OSBT to consider a disposal motion, what information would OSBT first need? And we list some stuff, but that's not all of the things we listed that we would need. And I'm not sure that conditional statement about for us to consider a motion, a disposal motion, the, this is what we would need. It may not have been carried through to everything. Um, well, the other ones show up later on. I, you think so? Uh, well, I, I took a look at it. I, I will say every time a new person looks at this, like you, they find something important. I know that happened when Dan looked at it, when John Potter looked at it. And so, um, Dan, what do you think? Uh, I mean, in some ways, we'd like to get this council right away. In other, uh, you could argue there's no dying critical need for it right now. And so we could entertain some changes to this and bring it back for the next uh, month's meeting. Well, it's the kind of thing that could go on for months and months and I don't want yeah. to advocate yeah. for that. So yeah. I just want to say. Yeah, ultimately my opinion on this, is this is the board's document. Um, staff is willing to provide assistance and help when you want it and how you want it. Right. Certainly, if a couple of you want to continue to work on it and bring it back to your group, and 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 if you care for John and I to look at it, you know, as a, as, you know, an editor or as a, you know, are we missing anything? We're, we'll be happy to play that role. Um, okay. I don't think there's there's any pressure, Kurt. Um, I think we're in a good place that if you all want to do, you know, there's a couple of points here that are concerning, and you want to do what you need to do here. I think waiting another month is not, is not a big deal. Okay, then I'm going to nominate Karen to take the first shot at adding some stuff. And, uh, and then we'll get it back to you, Dan, with some proposed changes. And if anybody else has any other, you know, red line strikeout stuff, we'd be happy to get it. So, uh, so could I, I would say, yeah, yeah, Dave. Could I just jump in real quick? First of all, I want I, I think this is an excellent document and very helpful. And thank you very much to everyone who worked on it. It'll be I think it'll be very useful in the future. What I'm what I was thinking is that you know some of the board actions have multiple kind of uh, uh, direction. And so I, I, I like the, you know, the sections in the, the organization, but what I'm wondering is maybe it's just as easy to put, you know, the same language under various sections so that rather than trying to develop a narrative, you can just see that, you know, that 
this particular part of the motion actually applied to a number of um, you know of the organizational sections, and it would be uh, I, somewhat repetitive. <clears throat> but on the other hand, I think as one looks at this and doesn't look at the entire document, but just kind of goes through and says, "Okay, what happened?" or "What what did the flood wall actually? What was the purpose of the flood wall?" Then you could see that you know here were a number of references <clears throat> in the various motions to the flood wall. Uh, Dave, I think you may be right. Uh, can I ask that you give us an example or two of that and send it to Karen? Well, I will use her initial example on the disposal uh, issue and say that language may actually occur in at least two and maybe more of the sections. And I think it would be easy to add that language in brackets at the beginning of multiple sections. So right. if you have a thought about how that might work, scribble something down and, and send it to Karen. I'll happily do that. <laughs> and, and she'll happily receive it. Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> okay. Thank, thanks to everyone. Uh, I, I think this is very helpful. Well, glad to hear it. Uh, any other thoughts, folks, before we move on? Okay. Um, so here's, here's um, one thing we have left to do is to let folks look at the upcoming meeting agendas and ask any questions about those. And so why don't we turn to that and see if it's raised any questions uh, for folks. Uh, and so that's like two or three pages into the, the packet. <clears throat> You're talking about the tentative calendar for future meetings? Exactly right. Thank you, Karen. I mean, this is a good time to ask uh, Dan and Steve what they were thinking in terms of strategy. Some of it Dan's already described in terms of spacing things like the revision of uh, uh, disposal policy over multiple months, uh, which I think is really good. Yeah, you'll see that same strategy playing out. You. Uh, the written information is not reflected in here, but for instance, on voice and sight and dog monitoring, you're going to actually start getting written information on that prior to meetings where we actually have discussions on it. So as much as we can, uh, you know, that is sort of the roadmap is we'll provide you with written information first prior to future meetings discussions. So just like with this document that Kurt just referred to, we have that same strategy taking place with Voice and Sight coming up this fall. Uh, so when you see Voice and Sight actually on the calendar here, uh, just know, for instance, that particular project, you would actually be getting written information prior to that. One thing, Thanks. Kurt, one thing Kurt, I was going to suggest, um, you know, I, I think the importance of a retreat uh, means that it should be on at least August agenda to you know report back from the committee and kind of keep keep that momentum going because I think uh, it's really important that we the board and staff get get together informally and uh, go over you know yeah. and and Dave I actually uh, uh, made already made that um, okay. change on the document that before this is created. So I put board retreat update on the next few meetings. Great. So um, that, that, that will Thanks, be reflected. Dave. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Other questions or suggestions? Okay, I'm going to assume, uh, Karen, you've got your hand up. I have a question that, uh, may not be reflected on this tentative calendar, um, but it's, it comes from both the written information that we got, written information item C, and from the uh, staff's list of all the COVID response considerations uh, they've been doing and thinking about doing. And it has to do with parking. And I just want to get um, some feedback from staff about the, the 
the parking part of the COVID response said something like, we're looking into how to accommodate more parking. Uh, that's not a direct quote. Um, overflow parking and parking plan, consider overflow parking hotspots. Um, and, and in the, the quantifying parking on OSMP managed trailheads project, um, clearly the work that's being done is to establish a baseline. I understand that that's an obvious purpose and it, it's really useful. My question is, um, for phase two, what is the purpose of doing that? And what is staff thinking that information will be applied for? And you're talking about the written information C and the related analysis. Correct. Um, Karen, that, uh, unfortunately, we lost Dion Vanderwoody, who would have addressed that. Um, we didn't know this was going to be uh, an issue that we were going to cover this late in the meeting. Um, but I we can didn't, we, She hasn't left OSMP. She's just gone to bed. <laughs> She's gone, right? uh, other things <laughs> I just want to make sure we haven't lost her. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, from the meeting, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, basically that is to um, further refine the baseline um, on specific questions on um, the, the, the parking areas, the trailheads that uh, are identified through the phase one uh, study. I can have, um, I, I believe that we were planning a follow-up written memo on, um, on visitation numbers and we can have that, we can ask them to elaborate on that in a written memo that I think is scheduled for your next meeting. Yes, it is. Thanks, Jan. I um, thought I saw it somewhere there, but um, so yeah. the, the so before there's a major effort by staff to create offsite parking and extend parking opportunities, there'll be a, a policy discussion by at the board. Yeah, I, 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 I just want to clarify that. So when you're talking about parking, parking utilization, parking congestion, whatever, you know. There's, you develop a toolbox, which may have a dozen different type of strategies and tools, and then you're going to have to go site specific of what could work for one particular trailhead may not at all be applicable for another. So the blanket statement that, what, you know, the effort behind us is to increase parking is, is not accurate. Um, there could be one particular trailhead where in order to alleviate an issue that there's agreement that needs to be alleviated, perhaps creating a couple more parking spots is the right option, but that's just, that, that we cannot assume that that tool is going to be applied throughout the whole system. It's, a, it's gonna be a case by case basis and this data is gonna allow us to assess each site a little bit independently of all those tools in our toolbox, which comes out for this particular site. And Dan, it may also help, and I don't know the specific part of the memo that Karen's referencing, but I know one example is where we have a lot of informal parking that happens along Flagstaff Road at the pull-offs, and it may be inferring again that we're just trying to formalize what makes sense for delineating parking, what's been just kind of developing because people are parking and it's enhancing what has been just kind of informal parking and, and trying to get a better handle on managing that during this COVID frame. So I think you know, that's a, a, an example of where we may do some parking. There may actually be something that helps formalize the spot on the road, which is already serving that in, in combination with removing some other sites that are, as Mark alluded to earlier, maybe fostering where people are parking and then entering into the HCA off of Flagstaff. I, my only uh, argument with you, Steve, is I'm not assuming that the demand level during COVID is going to go away, but <laughs> that's a whole nother debate. <laughs> we turn lots of new people onto open space. Yeah. yeah. I'm forever an optimist. <laughs> Good. Keep it up. We need it. <laughs> now more than ever, as they so, said. So in that, in that vein, I just wanted to ask, uh, have you guys had an opportunity meet, to meet with David Cooper and others uh, as a follow-up to his concerns on uh, Shanahan? Shanahan. Yeah, thanks. I can answer that one if you like. Uh, uh, Lisa Goncalo, myself, 
uh, Alison and um, Ajit John Potter as well attended like an internal staff meeting just to follow up and have a conversation. And then Alison's followed up with him directly. Uh, and so transport community vitality in ourselves and our working with them. And uh, we've definitely been emailing. And the next step is to figure out if we need a, a meeting follow up. But there's been really good coordination. And Lisa's having a call with him tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, Alison. That's the best idea. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, good coordination. Okay. Thanks, Dave, for the question. Our ambassador to the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Unless there are other matters that board members would like to bring up, I think that's our agenda. Anybody have anything I, to show? Yeah, Dan. I just want to remind you that you did uh, extend an invitation to a community member to provide oh. comment. Um, yes. And I. Yeah, she just came back on. Okay, great. I, I was hoping oh. we'd get a we'd get a heads up in the middle of the meeting, but okay. Sorry, whoever you are to make you wait this long, but we're happy so to hear from I you. I believe it's Lynn Siegel. So do you want to give her three minutes for public comment? Yes. Sure. Okay. So um, I can unmute her and Leah, if you wanna if you can pull up the three minute screen again. Thanks. So Lynn, you should be, let's see. Yeah, you should be unmuted now. Yeah, that's fine. It's just, you know, you put two meetings on, two board meetings that are critical and you have people jumping back and forth, waiting each time to come in. You know, I had two important places to be at once. How can I do that? You tell me. How can I be at the Landmarks Board in here at the same time? And now I have to watch the other one all separately, but I can't contribute in the same way that I could if I were listening here about the prairie dogs that I wanted to and about the South Boulder Creek floodplain that I wanted to. And now I, have no, I don't know what you've said, and I can't listen until after what I've said. Is that fair to the public? I ask you. You've got... How many days in the month and how many boards? Spread them out. There's plenty, there's 24 hours in a day. You can have Zoom meetings anytime. And you choose to have them on the same night at the same time at six o'clock. Lynn, we're sorry about that, but use your two minutes to tell us what you really would like to see done in policy. Yeah, well now I'm just thinking about this house that was just being reviewed, you know? So it's kind of disconcerting to take someone out of one space and stick them into another and force them when they're not ready. Well, you know, in my anger, I'll say, see you, Sal, and I don't know what you talked about tonight. I wasn't privy to that. You know, sorry. I would have loved to have appeared and reacted to it, but I can't. So I'm just going to say, you know, you want to do see you, Sal? I'll tell you what's going to happen at see you, Sal. They're going to annex that place and then they're going to sell it because you know what? CU is not a school anymore, effectively. They're going to cut their population by probably half or more. They don't need another campus. And they certainly don't need, no, even if they did need another campus, they certainly don't need the city of Boulder to subsidize them anymore. We subsidize them how much, how often? The Hill Hotel, all of this, you know, land property about property elevation, homelessness, diversity issues. 1725, 1727, Top Hat Janitorial is now a multi-million dollar restaurant. You know, this is what Boulder is now. And it's just not appropriate. And Open Space Board of Trustees has a big say in what goes on because you, your interest here is in the people of Boulder and in the floodplain and resolving the issues there, not in benefiting CU because CU has lost its benefit to the Boulder, to Boulder long ago. Thank you, Lynn. I'm glad we could fit you in at the end of the meeting, and I'm sorry there was a conflict between uh, the boards. But there always uh, is. There always is. 
Okay. Well, you thank know. you for thank you for bringing it to our attention and sharing your comments. Uh, and do the board members have any other issues to bring up before we adjourn? Okay, then we stand adjourned until next month's meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And th and Thank thanks you. to staff. <laughs>